Good evening and welcome to Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to all of you as we are one day away from the weekend. Our guest tonight, Mike Brown from the ever-famous Dark Poutine podcast up here in Canada. You're going to love him and his true crime stories tonight. But before we bring Mike in, Let's get to the roll call. We have race fan in the gold medal position. The gorgeous Cosmic Floor takes home the silver. Stunning Steph Dickey with a bronze medal tonight. There's Chad Smith, everyone. The Chad Smith. Steam train mark in Australia. Glad to know that we are alive tomorrow since you live in the future. Thank you so much. Mennonite Abe, good to see you. Downshift. Doc from Wyoming. Thanks for coming on in, guys. Double Tim, Spacey Tree. Good to see you guys. How's it going, everyone? The awesome Ann Palmer Palmer is here. She'll be signing autographs after the show. Line up to the left of the studio for Ann, to the left of the studio. Spooky Morales, good to see you. The Ronald Penton, everyone. The Ronald Penton is here. As we continue on, there's Grandpa Holland. Smithy is here. He'll be signing autographs after the show as well. Line up to the right of the studio, if you don't mind to the right of the studio. Spooky Morales, how are you? Smithy, by the way, thank you so much for kicking off the Super Chat tonight. We really do appreciate your love of this show. Hello, Jason. How you doing? Umuamua, nice to have you back. As we continue on here, Cat Chaser, thank you so much for your continued um, support of Spaced Out Radio with another awesome Super Sticker. Thank you. And Jason, thank you so much for the Super Sticker as well. The Super Chat and Super Stickers are a fantastic way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. We really do appreciate your uh, support that way. All right, moving on here. Who else do we got? There's Big Willie and his beautiful beard. There he is. And uh, once again, he'll be hosting with John Hudson and Gemma Jade, the new After Hours show coming the second weekend of December, right after Lynn Wallington. Todd Purden, Iberata, how you doing in Singapore? Let us know. All right. There's Millennium. Noble Patrick. How you guys doing? 5900 bucks. The gorgeous, sweetly morbid bear. There she is. Give a wave. She always waves back. All right. Moving on. Richard Elmore is here. Welcome, Richard. Davy Jones Locker. Good to see you again. Thank you for joining us. Peppa H. Always a pleasure. Raven is Ryan. How you doing, buddy? Good to see you. Dim to dim. I love your name, by the way. I just do. It's so much fun to say. And uh, there's Grandmaster, you know, there he is. Uh, Who's this? All the way from Tokyo, we have Laura Powderham. How are you? Welcome to our channel. Thank you for joining us. And uh, there's the gorgeous and stunning Oracles and Beyond. Fast Hammy is back. Look at that. And uh, Bee's Nest and Wham Bam Ham. Good to see you guys. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Jose. Luscious Jewels, how you doing? Uh, there's our gorgeous Jenny, says, hello, SOR family. Hi, Nikki in Seattle. You're looking lovely tonight. Ozzy, Ozzy, oi, oi to you. John Swan, good to see you, my friend. And who else do we have here? There's the lovely Magic Maiden. Yep, Dirty Filth, wishing all the boils and ghouls, witches and warlocks a good evening. There he is. Uh, Jeremy Jones, good to have you here. How you doing? Eva. Eva. Eva, how are you? Thank you for joining us. And uh, let's see here. Who else? Rooted in gorgeous sacredness. How are you? Apollo 11. How you doing, buddy? And thank you so much for that super chat, man. Really do appreciate that so much. Thank you very much. Andres Garcia in Vegas, my favorite hometown away from my hometown. How are you? Welcome to SOR chat. Really appreciate you tuning us in. And uh, we are caught up for right now. We really are. And uh, you got to see something impressive, everyone. Look at Mike Brown's mustache. Look at that lip blade. That is high and tight. Gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. I, I can't grow that. I cannot grow that. I think I might be able to in about 35 pounds from now. But right now, can't do it. Cannot do it. And uh, we're going to get to Mike here in just a couple of seconds. And remember, the Super Chat is a fantastic way to uh, support this show and what we do on a nightly, weekly, monthly basis, along with, don't forget, you can do some shopping at the SOR Vault on our website. Go to shop on our website, and there it is. Here we go. 
From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read up on Shirky Poo's Newswire, and check out our swag. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. The Dark Protein Podcast is about true crime and dark history, and it's very unabashedly Canadian. That covers true crime, dark history, and other creepy topics from the perspective of two real live Canadians. Dark Poutine was born on Halloween in 2017, has over 1 million downloads. Mike Brown, who is here with us, is a creator and researcher. His co-host, Scott Hemingway, is somewhere else, not here tonight because we we have to pay all of our attention to Mike Brown's absolutely stunning mustache tonight, if you're watching on YouTube or Twitch. Together, they uh, record the show in Surrey, British Columbia, and they I'll tell you, they have got some great gigs going right across the country, talking about some of these true crime stories that have really been laid to rest. Mike Brown, thank you so much for coming back on Spaced Out Radio, my favorite Canadian friend. How are you? Great. I guess I should have updated you on a number of things there. Downloads almost fourteen million now. Holy so we're, cow. we're 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 astronomically you better, uh, you, way better ahead of you. you better update your profile and your bio then. And that other co-host, axe him out of there. He's gone. He's out of here. Oh, he's, uh, my fire he's, gone. he's been replaced by someone uh, who uh, is does a fantastic job. My longtime friend Matthew Stockton is now my co-host, Wonderful. and uh, and he is uh, an amazing dude. He's got like he's a, a real worldly guy, and uh, let's just say he brings a little more to the show intelligence-wise because you got to listen to Dum Dum over here most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I apologize about that because no, I'm no, no worries. On your website, God that so. You better update that. That's yeah. your fault. not mine. I'm, I'm, I'm blaming you for that one. It's old school, yeah. Anyways, it's been a while since we had you on the show, and thank you so much. I think it's been about a year, year and a half now. And you know what? It's that time of year where we get into some spooky tales. And by the way, congratulations on the publishing of your first book. Let's Let's hear about this. Well, it's called Murder, Madness, and Mayhem. And it, look, it's by this guy, Mike Brown, the... Uh, Co- the host and creator of the Dark Poutine podcast. And uh, it's crazy how this thing came about. I was uh, minding my own business here in Surrey at one point, and I, I got this email from a person, and, and uh, her email address was at HarperCollins Canada. And I thought, well, someone's trolling me. And she said, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I thought, well, you know, I have thought about writing a book, but I think that you are not who you say you are. So baloney on you. And I left it alone for probably 15 minutes before I replied. <laughs> I had to mull it around like, is this person for real or not? And I did. And I asked, are you for real was the first line. And she said, yes, I am. And here we are two years later, like two years it took to get this book written, edited and published. And uh, on November 2nd, it's going to be in stores everywhere. You can pre-order now from the website, darkpoutine.com, but holy crap, it actually happened. Good for you. You deserve it, man. You know what? The one thing that I really admire about you uh, is the fact that 
you know, you're doing this, you got a great sense of humor, you're a great, honest guy, but you're doing something that you love and you're bringing attention to something that in a lot of cases is long forgotten in Canada. Because what our American and worldly friends don't really understand about Canada is we're not a country that really pays attention to its history, its lore, its legends. You know, if it isn't within the last 10 years, we don't care about it. Uh, we're very relaxed and laid back and probably way too aloof about that, hmm. you know. So, you know, for you bringing up a lot of these old school crime stories and and, and everything that you've written down in your brand new book, I, I'm wondering, you know, how did you come about this? Well, Why is it important? Um, I kind of have to go back to when I was a kid. Uh, my grandmother was really into the true crime uh author Max Haynes, uh, and he was a newspaper writer, and um, he wrote stories, wrote true Canadian true crime stories uh, in a weekly column in, in newspapers all over Canada. He was a Nova Scotian, just like me, so when I heard, hey, a Nova Scotian actually does some writing, I thought, well, I'm a little kid, I'm going to read that stuff, and it was really fascinating to me, and then when I was around 12 years old, uh, I had a guy who tried to abduct me and drag me into the woods for nefarious purposes. I luckily got away. But um, uh, after that, I had kind of this question in my head, what kind of person actually does that to people? And after living the life that I have, I went through addiction and all kinds of different things uh, that I went down some pretty dark roads. And uh, I found out now that you know, I kind of had to go through all that to get to the point where I realized, hey, all these dark stories really do have a moral of some kind. And sometimes it's a cautionary tale. Sometimes it's uh, uh, it's entertaining. Like, I mean, one of the stories that we told was uh, a, a gentleman who was taking money or taking gold from the mint, the Canadian mint, by putting the little pucks of gold that they were creating there up his bum and uh, and absconding with them through the metal detector. He would set the metal detector off and all that kind of stuff. And they would wand him and he'd say, oh, it's probably something like, you know, I got a pin in my hip or something like that. But, uh, you know, there's all kinds of Canadian stories out there that just don't get told. I was talking to somebody from CBC today and she was asking me, why, why are you telling all these stories? And I, I said to her, Canadian news is a really regional thing. We will tell a story in New Brunswick that you don't hear about in Saskatchewan, you know? Uh, so what I try to do is bring those stories uh, from that are more regional to everybody. Anybody in Canada who wants to learn about something, they can learn about it on my show. Well, look at you. Look <laughs> at you. I mean, if that isn't a shameless plug, I don't know what is. Oh, I have many more, yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I absolutely hear you. Uh, it, you know, the one thing that I that I love about uh, the way you work is, is your your caution to detail. Hmm. You are someone who I, I've known through listening to your podcast. You want every detail of a crime. You want every detail of a mystery that you can find. Where did you find this detail from? Uh, it depends on the the story. A, a lot of it is available. Um, with um if you look hard enough you can find stuff anywhere but um, i have access to some different uh court websites what well, a ufo garage oh look at that but uh i have some access to different things uh, now that i'm with chorus entertainment the curious cast network they've given me access to global news archives and all that kind of stuff so luckily i can use something from global news say they've done a piece on a particular crime i can use audio or uh dig out anything and, and quote it directly because um uh, they have allowed me to do that so i'm very lucky in that way it's digging for the detail is is like you just got to be willing to turn over the right rock you know and if you turn over enough of them you're going to find what you're looking for definitely did you always have a passion for true crime like yes. I realized you had that situation that you had, but yep. a lot of times you try and steer away, but this was always a passion for you. Yeah, it was always something that I was interested in. Um, 
my most recent episode uh, is on death. And, uh, and that's that idea that uh, what I bring into it is the idea that Ernest Becker, the author Ernest Becker talks about is that deep inside every one of us, we are the only animal that knows at some point we're going to die. So that's where this fascination with things like horror, things like the supernatural, things like paranormal, uh, things like true crime come from is this human idea that, holy crap, we're going to die. And there's this scary thing that's out there that we don't really understand. So how do we approach it? Uh, we have to approach it through our culture. So, um, yeah, that's, it's kind of, but you were never a cop. You were never an, a private investigator or anything along those lines. Well, no, I did security. I, that doesn't really count, but I did security for, uh, a large security company here in uh, the lower mainland. And uh, one of the things I did was uh, I drove mobile security. So I was all over the lower mainland uh, at night and I got to see some really crazy things. And I got to interact with a lot of police officers. I did have a desire to be a cop when I was a youngster. A friend of mine and I did our grade 11 job shadowing uh, with the RCMP in New Minas, Nova Scotia. And uh, so there, um, if you remember the Goler family, which was a family that was uh, uh, sexually abusing their children in, on the south mountain of Nova Scotia during the 80s, 70s and 80s, um, I got, was driven to that place with, uh, by one of the RCMP officers there. And he was just like, hey, uh, this is where that happened. So it also got me thinking about more regional Nova Scotia, more regional Canadian cases, just getting involved with these people. It was pretty fascinating. Yeah, that, that is amazing. You know, I mean, for me, when I grew up in the lower mainland, you know, everything was innocent until Clifford Olson came right. around. And all I remember was my parents and my sisters telling me, because I was only seven, eight years old when, when he was running around before he was caught, and he ended up mur murdering 14 children before they, they finally caught him on, on a fluke, almost mm -hmm. a fluke. And, yeah. and all I remember growing up was, you know, if you see any dark vans uh, and they stop, run away as fast as you can and go knock on someone's door. I know? covered I covered Clifford Olson in uh, one of my episodes early on because that case, uh, he was caught pretty much the week after I was assaulted by this guy uh, who assaulted me. So I was sort of drawn into that case as relating to it in the way that uh, I had been a victim myself, or I shouldn't call myself a victim. I'm a survivor myself of that kind of uh, individual. And uh, so when the, all the Olsen stuff was going on, I kind of conflated it in my mind with the things that were happening to me. So as a result, I ended up doing an early episode of Dark Poutine on Clifford Olson, and I've had uh, uh, a chapter in a book by Mitzi Sestero, who does true crime anthologies, and it was based on Clifford Olson. And I've had a few people come to me after I've done these episodes and talk to me about uh, some of the different criminals that they've known. And one uh, person who knew Cr Clifford Olson was my friend Peter, and he... Uh, was around that age, the age that Olson liked back in the day. And Peter was looking for a job. So he was approached by Clifford Olson, hey, come painting with me. And decided, okay, I'm going to go paint with this guy. I'm going to go paint a house with this guy. And they're walking to the car, and Peter has this sort of impending doom feeling happening. And he put his hand on the door handle to get in the car and something screamed in his head, do not get in this car. So he just turned and ran in the other direction. And uh, it turned out later that the person that had asked him to go painting was Clifford Olson. And it was during the summer of his murder spree. So I, I want to ask you, uh, as we got about eight and a half minutes before we go to break here mm -hmm. at the bottom of the hour here on Spaced Out Radio. Sure. Mike Brown from the Dark Poutine podcast is with us. What makes the lower mainland of British Columbia such a haven for serial killers? 
Oh, good Lord. I don't know. And that goes right. But you, if you think about it, that goes right down the West Coast. Mm -hmm. Washington has had a number. Oregon has had fewer. California has had a number as well. Yeah. So, I mean, California, Washington, and British Columbia, for some reason, have had some of the most heinous uh, serial killers that are out there. Yep. Ted Bundy, a guy named... uh, uh, Wesley Allen Dodd in the night, uh, in the Night Stalker. Yep, all of these guys uh, along the West Coast, and people say that the Pacific Northwest specifically, um, it's because of all the rain and how dreary it is here. Our uh, rates of suicide are higher, and maybe that's why our rates of murder are higher. That people are just a little messed up by not getting enough sunshine. I don't know, but uh, but yeah, it's it's pretty fascinating that on the West coast, there seems to be centered some of the worst, like Ted Bundy, uh, Gary Ridgeway, the uh, yes. green river killer, you know, like, holy crap. And of course we would be amiss if we didn't mention Robert Picton, the guy from our own backyard right here. Uh, just a, a horrendous individual who was upset that he didn't get 50. Yeah. Did I ever tell you that I was actually there the day that got busted? Where the pig farm? Oh, geez, really? I was working for my radio station and I was the sports guy. Mm-hmm. And I ended up, uh, um, I was told point blank, I had heard about what had happened in, in Port Coquitlam. Mm-hmm. And I would take the uh, the number seven highway home. Yeah. And I, so I got asked, could you bring a box of batteries to our reporter out there? And I got there. I ended up staying there for about an hour and a half, mm-hmm. you know, cause I just, you know, as a journalist, you want to, you want to get in there. You want to feel it. You want to know what it's like yeah. and watching. I mean, the, the, they had these 15 foot tarps blocking the entire property. So mm-hmm. you couldn't get in uh, the mobile trucks from every Canadian network and every major U S network from Fox to CNN to NBC, ABC, CBS, they were all there as well. I mean, just a horrific, horrific state that I don't think we're ever going to know the full story that happened there. No. And the thing about him is, is like that people think it's a pig farm. It's the middle of nowhere. No, it was right behind the Home Depot in Port Coquitlam. Like it was like literally across the street from the Home Depot where when I lived in Maple Ridge, that was where I went to get my, you know, my plumbing supplies and all that kind of stuff. So my wife at the time, and myself decided that we needed to go to Home Depot. And we didn't know where the pig farm was, but we knew about it as soon as we got there because there were all the news trucks. So we stood and watched the RCMP essentially sift through dirt for like an hour and a half. And it was this eerily quiet thing to watch all these people in the white Tyvek suits milling about that property and, and trying to collect evidence. It was very, very creepy. When you deal with all of these morbid type topics that you do, how do you keep your own sense of mind without making it personal? Because we invest ourselves in something. Mm -hmm. Usually it it becomes personal to us. It Mm -hmm. becomes a personal quest one way or another. Well, for me, a big part of it is, um, is trying to keep my feet on the ground. I have other things that I do. Uh, uh, I meditate every day. Um, I, I try to have interactions with people who have no uh, stake in true crime or any of the dark stuff that I'm into. And uh, honestly, for my spare time, I'll watch something like Downton Abbey or, or uh, some anime or um, something like Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> something that doesn't, you know, that doesn't if, involve creepy. If you got to pull out the Little House on the Prairie, man, that I, I feel for you. <laughs> yep, yep. I'd rather watch Laura Ingalls uh, deal with, you know, not being able to catch that chicken in the yard than uh, watch somebody trying to hurt someone else, you know. <laughs> I, I I have a pretty pretty diverse taste. No, and, and I can I can totally see that and and I appreciate that with that. And I think you have to be able to to uh, really take a look at yourself and and internally you have to have that sense of humor that goes along with it, because if you didn't, it would drive you crazy. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the thing about the show. Like we start the show off a little light uh, and then we take you into a dark place 
uh, down into the depths of whatever the story it is that I'm telling. And, uh, and at the end of the show, we'll bring you back out into the light with a little light banter and, and some fun. And uh, even our outro, I, I designed it so our outro music is a little lighter than the, the intro music, you know. And speaking of intro music, I want to compliment you on that drumming. That was that was pretty interesting intro music. I really dig that. Did somebody do that for you no, specifically? I, I actually, so for our radio people who don't know, on the YouTube side of everything, I, I have this little uh, drum set, not me playing the drums or anything like right, that. Yeah. But, but this uh, 90 se- uh, one minute to 90 second uh, drum solo that uh, absolutely just kind of gets you going. And I, I actually found that on YouTube under the copyright free. There you go. Perfect. Absolutely well, worked for me. And the, and the, and the pictures of Bigfoot and uh, UFOs and that kind of stuff. Perfect. I love it. It's so fun. It's really cool that, uh, that shows like yours can exist. Um, you know, we've we've had those the shows around for years and years, but that more people are getting interested in uh, things like paranormal and supernatural, and we've talked about it before, like the woo of things. I'm 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 really kind of it's cool that it's making a comeback. There for a while, it wasn't. It didn't seem like it was in vogue, but uh, I, I would like it to go not in vogue again. Yeah, I really would. Why so? Much. I'm going to sound like a real jerk when I say this, but I don't (laughs) mean it that way. What it's done is it's given a lot of people who don't deserve, I don't, that's wrong. That's wrong. Cause everybody deserves to have their voice heard. Sure. It, 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 it waters down the quality of what we are doing too much. Mm -hmm. I gotcha. And, And it segregates and, and simplifies everything so much that all of these cliques have formed and if you don't fall into one of those clicks, you end up being a target. Yeah, there's there's that kind of thing in the true crime community, too. Uh, whereas if you don't fit within one certain group, uh, that that group will ostracize you and, you know, not want anything to do with you. But typically, uh, the true crime community is a great group of people. Um, that's what I'm trying to foster with our our Facebook group, The Yumber Yard. We were talking off the air first about uh, how Facebook decided to hose both of us. You lost a group with 14,000 and I lost a group with 10,000. We It was the same day that it happened to both of us. So Really? I, I didn't yeah. know. They must have hit a bunch of us because I had my profile eliminated, mm-hmm. our page eliminated, mm-hmm. um, our newswire eliminated. Gail, our news lady, had her profile eliminated. Michael W. Hall, our Sunday host of the time. And our and our team lawyer had his profile eliminated. It so, was- so so a lawyer had his profile. Like, yeah. Oh wow, that's yeah. ballsy. Oh, it was crazy. Hey, Mike, mm-hmm. I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the top of the hour. Mike Brown from the Dark Poutine Podcast. He has a brand new book out coming out November second. Murder, madness, and mayhem: twenty five tales of true crime and dark history. This is one for your library. I promise you that. Spaced Out Radio continues with Mike Brown right after this. Groovy. All right, we're clear. Cool. Yeah, man. (laughs) That's fun. Yeah, we're almost, we're one fifth of the way done. One fifth of the way. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i've realized i can't drink any pop anymore so now i drink sparkling water like if i drink pop while i'm talking i end up with a bad case of the ahems dude i i was on a two to six pepsi a day addiction yeah and june of last year i cracked my last pepsi oh there you go good for you and uh yeah <clears throat> what did barther say Any spaced out radio what gutter did you dig <laughs> Uh, <laughs> what gutter did you dig Mike Brown out of? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, it's my buddy Barther. He is. Uh, how do you how do you say uh, what Bart L means to me? 
Um, he is one of the funniest human beings I know. He is a man who has helped me carve my niche and understand what I need to do um, on the show. And he, um, he, he's been a good voice and a great help behind the scenes of what we are doing. Mm. He really has. So um, Kingdom of Bart, there he is. There right. he is. He he doesn't have filter, and he does it to uh, uh, he does it to try. His goal in life is to rile everybody up, but he uh, but deep down, and he's going to kill me for saying this on his forum. I know that, but he does have a heart of gold. He just doesn't like to show it, and uh, I really respect the man. That's for he's, sure. He's like the hooker with a heart of gold in those old westerns. The <laughs> yeah, except his uh, his dress hangs a little bit lower. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. And doesn't quite have the teeth for it. Ah, well, he has all of them. Barely. Oh. <laughs> Barely. Yeah. Hi, Drake. How you doing? And who else has joined us? Nicola, what's happening? And uh, Scary Gary, welcome to the show. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button, ring that bell. Terry Brown, good to see you coming in. Solar Warden, thanks for joining us. As we continue on here, lots of people coming in. It's good stuff. Very good stuff. Right on. Oh, oh, damn it. My stupid video card is acting. I got two screens. So my camera is here. Mm -hmm. and my main screen is here. But every now and again, my video card is acting up. So yeah. I go to my second screen. And now it's just flashback to my regular screen. So now I got everything. Uh, I can see. I can see the change in in light when that yeah. happens. Yeah, it drives, <laughs> drives me absolutely crazy. Prairie Fire, how are you, John Brown? Good to see you. Uh, we got about um, a minute and a half here, bud. Hi, the quick. Groovy. Join us. Yep. So, yes, my new hoodie, by the way, from UFO Garage. Great podcast from Ben and Joe. Thank you so much. Absolutely love it. I got a t-shirt today too. Uh, I couldn't put it on because the Chinese XL just was about the size of a medium. And, <laughs> and I'm not going to lie. My man boobs were sticking out a little too much. So I had to, couldn't put it on. Uh, Fedora wearing John, uh, John uh, um, Hudson. How are you? And uh, Zoom, nice to see you. So I got the hoodie and I got a beautiful pillow. Uh, from UFO, and I, I did get a a uh, coffee mug from Varla Ventura. Eric with a K is here, everyone. Remember, Eric with a K. We used to be his fourth favorite show. We're up to number three right now. We're up to number three. We're in the bronze. That's minute. awesome. Congratulations. Yeah. Hey, we used to be number four for about. We were number two at one point, and then we dropped down to number four. Yeah. yeah. Altered. How are you? Welcome. Yeah, I like Eric. Eric, I, I got busy. I forgot to call you back. I'll, I'll give you a call tomorrow, bud. Eric with a K. And uh, continue our chat. We got about one minute here. Okay. So, yeah. Well, look at that. Number two is on the horizon right there. Oh, boy. Uh, that's, that's awesome. Cool. That's a lot of pressure right there. Right? A yeah. lot of pressure right there. You got to pull out all the stops. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. I want to say a big thank you to Simon from Australia, Apollo, Jason, Cat Chaser, and Smithy for the awesome super chats. Reminder, it is a great way to help support what we do on a nightly basis and uh, just continue on doing what you guys are doing and, and being awesome. And thank you to all the veterans out there who tune us in on a nightly basis. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to have you here. You always have a safe home here with us on SOR. So make sure that you check it on out and continue on with your support and all our regulars here. Uh, let's, uh, let's have some fun here and uh, here we go. Second half hour of Space Out Radio is underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. 
Want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot, reading up on Shirky Poo's Newswire, and checking out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with Dark Poutine's Mike Brown, a great Canadian podcast on true crime. You can hear it all over the CuriousCast.ca network. Brought to you sure. by He's in the union. He's in the union for oh, a no. no, I'm oh, teasing. No. I'm teasing, but it's a lot of fun to say that. So I got a lot of friends who work for Global. But yeah. nonetheless, welcome back, buddy. And I, I want to say this. Uh, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, uh, Mike's brand new book, his first book, 25 Tales of True Crime and Dark History, will be out on November 2nd. So make sure you wait for that or hit your pre-orders. And Mike, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited. I, I, have, a, I have a lot of people, dude, asking about... Uh, the Williams case in Ontario, the former military man, mm -hmm. uh, high ranking Canadian uh, armed forces official who yep. ended up stalking women, raping women, and eventually killing one or yep. two, I believe. Three. Three. Yeah. W did you cover that? The, there's a lot of. Uh, I have uh, not covered that yet. Uh, it, however, it's rather timely because I am working on uh, research and scripting for that right now. So it's coming. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna be doing that very soon. What about that case? Have you learned? Oh gosh. Uh, well, my friend Alan Warren, who uh, yeah, it's a great guy. Yeah, he wrote a book on that case and actually had some conversations with uh, Russell Williams, uh, which is fan fantastically amazing. But Williams is an interesting character. I mean, he was, uh, you know, uh, the head of the, I think it was Petawawa, the uh, uh, Canadian forces base. And like, he's the commanding officer of a Canadian forces base and a serial killer. You know, you got to do something in your off time. I guess you might as well, when you're not flying the queen around, you might as well be stalking and killing women. Uh, what the heck? Um, he was a, a lot more than that, though. He was going into uh, people's houses and doing not so nice things in their underwear, taking them, stealing them. When police caught him, they found a uh, bag upon bag, garbage bags full of ladies' underwear that he had stolen from different houses all around uh, the Ontario. And he loved to have his own photo taken. Uh, his, he would take photos of himself dressed in their underwear, sometimes in their houses. Really creepy guy. You know what uh, I found very interesting about that? H have you ever watched the debriefing of him when he was interrogated by the police? Yep. That video apparently caught the attention of almost every police force in North America yep. on how to deal with serial killers. Yeah, because it's a it's a masterful uh masterful display of that particular type of interrogation in how to gain somebody's trust, how to break them down, when to introduce the evidence at certain times. And he was uh, essentially disarmed by this police officer and broken down to the point where he just had to say, yeah, I did that. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it was, was amazing. Weird. Yeah. And, and for our listeners, if you want to check it on out, you can watch it for free on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. it, it is incredible and it is captivating. And I don't watch a lot of long form videos like that because I just mm -hmm. don't have time. But that one I watched. It was absolutely incredible. Absolutely yeah. incredible. Yeah, he's he's one of the the Canadian heavy hitters, I guess you would call it. Um, I've kind of avoided a few cases like I haven't done Bernardo yet. Um, uh, I haven't done Luca Magnata. Yeah. I don't want to even say his name because he loves it. He loves it so much to hear people talking about him. Uh, don't blank with cats was the, the documentary series that, and it's F word, 
that he did uh, they did on him on Netflix. Um, I haven't even watched it. Uh, I just refuse to deal with anything with that guy because I just loathe him so much. But um, I don't cover a lot of those large cases because everybody else on the planet has already covered them. Everyone knows about those people. What do I have to add to the, to the conversation? I don't know if it's very much, but I'm starting to get closer to having some more, having a run at some of those bigger cases because A, I feel a little more confident. I'm 193 shows in. The Christmas show this year will be our 200th show. Uh, so I feel like a, I have a little more confidence around what I'm doing and my storytelling ability. But um, yeah, I still, there's still stories out there that are so little known that uh, I think are far more compelling in a lot of different ways. So I'll tell those, the bulk of those. As grotesque as this may question may be, what makes a good story for both Dark Poutine and your book? I don't think there's anything grotesque about it. I think um, it, what I want to tell is a story that has a real uh, human aspect to it. I don't just do the whole idea of like, here's what the killer did and here's you know how he went about it and those kind of things. I want to talk about the people who were affected around these events. I want to talk about the community. I want to talk about the families of victims. I want to talk about survivors. I want to talk, congratulations, Sandra. Somebody's having a, a baby girl. Looks like that's amazing. And Sandra, I guess is going to be a grandmother. Yes. So. Yes. Sandra, you always have to say her name three times. So, oh, I, well, well, I'm not going to say it with a mirror around because you know what happens. It will her. Yeah. Her showed up here and it, <laughs> It's middle of the night. It's not. It, it's scary. It, there it's you totally go. Scary. But uh, congratulations, Sandra, one of our longtime listeners on becoming a first-time grandma here. Coming well, that's here. very so cool. Congratulations yeah. to you and your lovely family. And I know you, this could be an exciting time for you. So enjoy it. Very much enjoy it. But, but yeah, get, getting back to what I was saying, though, um, I don't know. Like I just wanted stories that maybe had a little weird twist to them. Some of them people have heard a, a few times. Some some people will be not not as familiar with. Um, some are stories that have always kind of attracted me in a way. Um, I grew up, you know, a uh, twenty minute drive away from Oak Island. So uh, I've been to Oak Island myself numerous times as a kid before. Uh, Marty uh, Lagina and his brother were, you know, tearing up, uh, yeah, tearing it to pieces. There were other people who tore it to pieces over the years, but um, I got to be there before it was a there was a lot of attention on it, like there is now. And so I decided I'd include that story in my book just because I had some connection to it that I felt. And, and that's kind of what I tried to do. I included in my disaster section, uh, there's four different sections. Um, one is, uh, I will tell you here in a sec. So the murder with a twist is the first one. Then there's perpetual puzzles, uh, the madness of crowds, and then notable disasters. And like I mentioned, the uh, notable disaster that I really felt connection to was uh, the Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980. Uh, it was the first time I ever saw a dead person in a photograph, and that was on the cover of Time magazine. That young boy, I think he was 11, laying in the back of uh, a pickup truck. He and his father and his brother were out camping and died uh, in the pyrocl pyroclastic flow of Mount St. Helens during the explosion. So, um yeah, it was just stories like that that I felt con some sort of connection to or wanted to learn more about, frankly. I can see th where that would affect. I remember that day because I lived, I, I was born and raised in Abbotsford, British Columbia. Mm -hmm. And I remember my my grandma, we went to, my mom and I went to my grandma's house in Abbotsford and she was like, did you feel the earthquake? Mm -hmm. And we were like, no, we didn't feel it. And then we find out about Mount St. Helens literally blowing up in, you know, a third of it <laughs> causing every, uh, so all sorts of damage yeah. and the eruption and everything. And then the ash started falling and, 
And it was uh, absolutely incredible. Did you have to shovel ash around where you we were? Never we yeah. never did. We uh, never did because the ash ended up blowing more east. Mm -hmm. But we did get a little bit. So sure. I, I, I recall that. And and it, it was a, a weird time because, you know, we had friends in Washington State and me, you know, you, you think, okay, well, we got Mount Baker right there. What happens if Mount right. Baker ever blew? You know, yeah. I mean, that's why I kind of miss living where I did in Mission, British Columbia, because I had the million dollar view. Yeah, right. Baker uh, ever blew. Yeah, it's beautiful. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, we're surrounded by large volcanoes. We're right along a, a big fault line here in British Columbia. Uh, the big shaker could come one day and into the ocean we shall fall. I don't know. <laughs> it's going to be interesting. Absolutely. Absolutely. So outside of, of the, the more mystic, and we're going to get into some crime stories here next hour that, that we're, I'm going to ask you about from Dark Poutine. Okay. You know, for you, what makes what makes somebody in what storyline makes it intriguing? Is it, is it the, the way the person uh, died? Is it the way the, the storyline kind of breaks out? How do you pick it? What's your perspective? Yeah. Like I say, I have to feel some sort of kinship or connection to people. Um, one story that I told was uh, involved a person I went to high school with. He, uh, his, sister-in-law turned up missing they weren't able to find her she just went missing one night her her shoes were gone and her one of her jackets was gone her car was in the driveway her keys and purse were in the house and she was gone missing and uh so this guy went out with his brother-in-law this my friend went out with his brother-in-law looking for this guy's wife and they couldn't find her uh and eventually they did find her and she was in the trunk of, uh, of a car that belonged to the family that was parked at a school that was nearby. And uh, she had worked at the school. But um, I always, Canada's a really small place. Um, it's very interesting that out of all the stories I tell, there seems to be some kind of connection once in a while that, um, uh, I don't know, something personal that makes it more personal. There's always people who will email me after a case and say, Oh, this person was my sister or this person was, you know, somebody I went to school with. It's crazy. Um, Canada's just, there's so many interesting cases out there. No, I, I fully understand that. What about the feet? The floating feet? <laughs> the floating feet. Because I was talking to an old news buddy of mine. Mm -hmm. We had a long discussion about this. Yeah. And he firmly believes, as do many police officers very quietly, that these floating feet in British Columbia that go into Washington State and all the way down to, to uh, um, uh, California, that they are literally or there is, pardon me, literally a serial killer doing this because yeah. everything is so s similar, but they don't want to admit that. They want to call it suicide. They want to call it whatever because they don't have any links to what is going on and they don't have any sort of, of knowledge of who may be doing this. But there's many who believe there is a serial killer who's been doing this for years and taking the bodies out on a boat at dropping them off. They know the fish and all the crustaceans are going to feed off the body and with the shoes that they're wearing, like running shoes that float, that's why you get one. Sometimes yeah. two. Yeah, it's really, the science behind it is really fascinating that uh, uh, apparently there's human fat turns into this adipose, which is very light and will float. And because the the foot is protected in the shoe when it separates from the body. It'll just kind of float to the surface and be able to float along. I don't know about a serial killer. I've, I've heard all kinds of different theories about it. it. It'd be interesting if there was a serial killer that was doing that. But um, some of the people they have, they think, proven that uh, they were suicides just off the Patella Bridge, which is actually just down the street from me here. And... Uh, uh, a couple 
uh, people, it has been proven that they were uh, in the depths of depression and took their own lives. So, but not everybody, you know, it could be a number of things going on. And, you know, we had, after the tsunami in Japan, we had things washing up here uh, that was from the tsunami, including body parts. So could be any number of things uh, up to and including somebody falling off a boat while they were fishing. But serial killers is a much more interesting theory and it's, it's more fun to think about that. But I don't know if there's any, any proof of it. If you say that police are talking to you about it, then somebody's thinking about it. Well, I mean, I think there is some legitimacy to concern over that. You know, mm -hmm. there really there really is some legitimacy in regards to what is going on. And, you know, with, with the, the whole feed issue, the fact that this is real, these aren't, you know, science classroom skeletons that are plastic. Mm -hmm. You know, these are real people at one point. And I realize yep. some of them, they, they have ruled as suicide, you know, which is sad. But I mean, Vancouver also has a real interesting portion of people who just vanish mm -hmm. and never be seen again. Probably the most popular one, actually British Columbia. In fact, Van the most famous one you'd think is Michael Dunahee right. from Va Vancouver Island. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Michael Dunahee is an interesting case. I covered that one. Uh, when I went, uh, I did a drive across Canada in 2018 and as I was driving, I sort of hit a few spots that I thought might be interesting from a true crime perspective. So uh, I drove by Lake Sammamish where Ted Bundy took two women uh, in the 70s. And uh, also just down the road from there is where his dump site was. As well, I stopped in Montana at Deer Lodge where there's a prison. And uh, the Deer Lodge prison is... It's a very old Gothic looking prison. It's sort of fallen apart. It's crumbling a little bit, but you can tour the prison. So I decided to tour it. Why? Because there were rumors and, and conjecture that the person who had been sending the Zodiac letters had actually spent some time in the Deer Lodge prison. So I thought, I kind of want to see where the Zodiac might have been. So I went into the prison and toured around. You get to tour the cells and all that kind of stuff. But in one room, they have uh, missing posters of women, children, men from all over North America. And there hit me right in the, in the face. As soon as I walked through the door, middle of the wall is the face of little Michael Dunahy in his red and blue windbreaker. You know, here I am, 1,200 miles driven a away from the coast and uh, I get to see Michael Donahue's face again. Um, and that's, that's how big an impact that case has had and how, how far flung people uh, looking for this young boy have been. I mean, who knows what happened to him? There's, he just essentially vanished from the playground one day. His mother turned around for, you know, uh, what was it? Three minutes and he's gone never to be seen again. I know it's such a scary, scary case that, you know, I think it still sits with every British Columbian, like 30 years old and over, mm -hmm. you know, it, yeah. it really, really does. But, but, you know, the aspect that I find very interesting about British Columbia, and I didn't know this until I interviewed David Politis, mm -hmm. that the Northwest shore mountains and the Cascade mountains there are number two in North America for people vanishing. Hmm. And just disappearing out of the blue. Number one is is Yosemite National right. Park, and number two is the Cascade Mountain areas. So, what did Politis say that 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 was the case? I didn't hear that episode. So, yeah, um, what uh, what what did he point to? A uh, number of people, like he has five or, or I believe ten different qualities that make for a case that that would be in a strange case. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what he did in order to build his case, you have to have a minimum of five of these qualities. Okay. And, and he, he says uh, point blank that, that the Vancouver area between North Vancouver and Maple Ridge mission, that's number two in North America for people just vanishing without any, 
any cause or understanding. Wow, I didn't know that. That's really fascinating. I should probably have him on my show to talk you, about you that. Really, you really should. You really yeah, should. Because that's really, really fascinating. I mean, I, I, I'm, a, I'm familiar with his work, but I wasn't familiar with, uh, with his focus on our region here. So that is fascinating. Yes. So, I mean, it is, uh, it is something that uh, David Politis is, uh, you know, I mean, so well known in regards to this. And I wish that we would take a little bit more look at this entire case, considering that this is an area where people just disappear. I mean, how many people have disappeared? You know, they go backwoods skiing uh, on, on Cyprus or Grouse or Seymour, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden they're gone. They, right. they, can't, they can't find them. Well, you should be able to find somebody in the snow with a trail. Mm -hmm. And there, I mean, there are also people who go missing in other parts of BC and are never seen again. Look at Ryan Stutka, for example. That's a case that I haven't covered yet. But, you know, he walked away from a party uh, there in the interior at some point and just disappeared into the snow. And there's been no sign of him since. Like his his mom, uh, God bless her soul, she, she keeps uh, returning to the area and searching for him year after year after year. And they're not able to find any sign that this guy, uh, what happened to him? Where did he go? Like he was a grown man. Uh, you know, with his faculties, sure, he may have been drinking or having a good time that night, but um, what happened to him? He just walked off into the into the snow, never to be seen again. He's got to be somewhere, something, somebody has to know where he is. Do you think, though, and I realize that you're you're on a on a on a woo scale of one to ten, you're maybe a three. Kind yeah, of maybe guy. a three. Yeah. Okay, you're maybe a three kind of guy. But, you know, a lot of the talk, you know, whether it's David Politis or others, uh, Steve Stockton from Oregon would be another good one to speak about this. You mm -hmm. know, do you think that maybe some of these people have just walked, wandered into a portal or something along those lines? When, when they cross through that portal, everything is the same. You know what I'm saying? I got you. Yeah. That's that's really interesting. I would love to I'd love to hear more about that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, we talk about the the uh, the paranormal stuff uh, around Bigfoot and, you know, interdimensional travel and that kind of thing. So um, I'd love to hear more about it. I, I'm not like you say, I'm about a three on the woo scale, but I am open to becoming a four five, six, seven or eight. You know what I mean? Like I would really love to learn more about these things uh in a way that uh maybe maybe i'm just maybe i'm just too much of an old grump i don't want to learn these things you kids and your fancy big foots i don't want to learn oh. i don't want to do that don't even get me started on monkey boy in vancouver <laughs> right don't what don't even get me started on that. But, Mike, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because when you come back, we're going to learn about some of these cases, not only the ones you put in your book, but other cases you've covered on the ever-famous Dark Poutine podcast, which can be found at CuriousCast.ca and DarkPoutine.com. Mike Brown is here. New book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, 25 Tales of True Crime and Dark History, which comes out November 2nd. We'll be back on Spaced Out Radio with hour number two, and we'll continue over there when we get back. All right, we are clear. Hey, uh, my wrenches, I want you to back off on. That is a buddy of mine who is trolling you guys bad. I realize the rules that I have set in place, and you know what? That is just... He's just here stirring up the crap, having a good time. He's probably uh, three bottles of Aqua Velva in right now. Oh, fancy person. <laughs> yeah, he's a fan. So just, uh, <laughs> just enjoy the humor for what it's worth because we got to just – I this isn't one of the YouTube trolls or the, the other host trolls that have come in here and hammered. So just, uh, let, just let him go. It's quite okay. It's quite okay. I got oh. this, one, guys. I got this one. Okay. 
Oh, Barther, you. You. I know he's sitting at his home somewhere in eastern Canada, probably on some rock in Newfoundland, just pissing himself laughing right now. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Off with his head. <laughs> Off with his head. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, you know what? I, I, I'm going to tell you, whether it's Chimp or Pigsty or Kingdom or whomever it may be or, or Green Pepper, all I'm going to say is it's a Montreal Canadiens fan. Oh, and, no. And, and if you know a Montreal Canadiens fan, uh, you can uh, you could, uh, understand that you can understand uh, the, the, the weird humor. My question is, is, is Big Willie's name descriptive or hopeful? Because uh, I'm, I'm curious. Not that I need to see, you know, I need proof in any way. I'm curious about, about Big Willie. Yeah, Willie's about six foot 10, about 480 pounds. And the beard is about uh, 250 pounds of that right there. Oh, dear. Yeah. That is a big willy. Yeah. So it works. YJ Overlander, how you doing, buddy? If it has a wrench, it's a small one, Mike. Well, there you go. Interesting. <laughs> Okay, well, whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's all right, guys. Just. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I was wondering what you were distracted by. <laughs> oh, that's my man, Arthur. My yeah. man, Arthur. Barther, be nice now. Come on. You got to be nice now. Leave leave gorgeous Jenny alone. Oh, dear. I'm going to remove that one. I got this one, guys, so don't worry about it. Oh, so the are the wrenches the mods? Is that what yeah, it is? I gotcha. I gotcha. My wrenches do a great job. Yeah. They do a fantastic job. And um, we, um, a few months ago, it started off just like out of the blue where, where we uh, got hit by a bunch of YouTube trolls, like like mm -hmm. bots. And some of the names on there and what they were saying was just grotesque. Yeah, there's, there's some pretty gross stuff. And uh, so it, then it started to happen like every about t eight to ten mm -hmm. weeks mm -hmm. with, with the YouTube bots. And then I had another show uh, that was sending uh, um, trolls in here to stir things up. And, um, and why bother? Like, why bother? People are just trying to have your, know. trying to entertain, have a good time. I don't, I don't know. And uh, so I had to add, like, I've always tried to have very few wrenches, mm -hmm. you know, because I want to give people a freedom to talk, you know. But after that, I had to load up on wrenches. Yeah. a little bit and just because i mean you lose people if i mean when with when these bots come in so my buddy here comes in here and he's he's helped uh uh he's helped me out i mean he's at you know his troll accounts are hilarious you know to some but especially to him because i think he likes to laugh at himself but <laughs> he, he is he has a heart of gold and he's helped me out a lot behind the scenes a lot oh, behind well, the there scenes there you go so he comes in here just just to stir it up to razz me up a little bit when he's not working. So that oh. <laughs> hey, thank you, Chad Smith, for the super chat tonight. Really do appreciate it. And uh thank you to Simon, Apollo, Jason, Cat Chaser, and Smithy. It's a wonderful way to support uh what we do here on Spaced Out Radio on a nightly basis, and we really do appreciate it. Um, you know, 
thank you so much. YJ, I know some people take my comments. Oh, uh, YJ, you're you're pretty cool. I I like you. I do. I mean, even though you live in Kelowna, I like you. You know, and and that's only because you have that great taco time there that has very good uh, burritos. Right? <laughs> Uh, burritos. Every time I'm in Kelowna, I got to stop at that taco time. My loved ones always pay for it when I have burritos. Hold on. Here we go. Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Here we go with hour number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Just go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. What the hell is this? Cucurbitophobia? Cucurbitophobia? I don't know, but that is the password as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot, reading up on Shirky Poo's Newswire, and checking out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on with Dark Poutine's Mike Brown, one of the best podcasts going in Canada. He's got a fantastic mustache. We always got to bring up the good facial hair around here. He's got a brand new book coming out November 2nd, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, 25 Tales of True Crime and Dark History. Mike, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it, bud. Cucurbitophobia, fear of pumpkins. Fear, fear of, of pumpkins. pumpkins. Look at yeah. that. Yeah. Normally, the clam puts it in our chat room, what the <laughs> password means. Oh, he did right there. Look at uh, that. Is an excessive, irrational, and unreasonable fear of pumpkins. Well, there you go. Amazing. Yeah. That's scary. What's happened? Why are, why are we afraid of pumpkins? Well, we're offended by everything now. Oh, there is that. Um, yeah, we're yeah. offended by everything now. Mm-hmm. So, I'll go be offended later. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, if you, if you can't be offended about something, yeah. you, know, you, you got you pick pumpkins. That's what you do. Sure, my friend, you have some incredible cases that you have covered, and you've uh, grabbed together about twenty-five of these stories in your brand new book that's about to be released: yep. Murder, Mayhem, and Madness. Uh, what are some of your favorite stories in there that you could share with our audience? Um, well, the first story actually, I think is my favorite one. And that's because it's a story that I followed while it was going on because it was so creepy and it's called girl gone. And it's the story of Jamie Kloss and she's a little girl from the United States, 13 years old, uh, one night, police get a phone call, a 911 call, and they're screaming on the call, and the police hear gunshots on the call as well. Uh, the caller was able to get the address out prior to, uh, prior to the gunshots, and police arrive at the home, find uh, a man dead, and in the bathroom, they find another, his wife, dead, and their daughter, 13 years old, is missing. And Uh, What had happened is a gentleman who was obsessed with this girl had blown the door open with his shotgun full of slugs, uh, shot the girl's father through the door prior, and then shot the mother uh, in the in the bathroom and taken off with the young girl. So she later uh, escaped, escaped. I think it was like 90 days or so later. She escaped and went to a neighbor's house and said, this guy's been holding me underneath his bed for this many days. It was horrendous. But just the fact that uh, it's unusual that this girl is still alive. Not only is she still alive, she was able to escape and uh, save her own life. So it was pretty, 
pretty interesting. And the guy obviously is has been caught and convicted of murder and kidnap. Wow. Now, when you were looking at these 25 cases, obviously you were looking all around North America and the world for the most interesting. That's you right. know, how did you decipher which ones to use and which ones you didn't? Uh, like I said, some of them, um, especially in the murder with a twist, were cases that they have like a little something extra to them. Um, maybe there's like a, a little bit more to it's not just an ordinary murder for money, murder for love, murder for, you know, jealousy, murder because of a drug deal. There is definitely something weird and uh, interesting that went on. One of those was uh, the case of uh, it's a, a young man who was a soldier during World War II decided that uh, he liked the sound of women's voices. So he would kill women to try to acquire their voices. Um, you know, uh, during one situation, he he noticed a woman was singing as they were wa as he was walking behind her, getting ready to, to to pounce. And when he jumped on her and started choking her, uh, she stopped singing. And he was like, "No, you should you should keep singing, because he loved the sound of her voice. That's what attracted him." So, you know, just really weird little things like that, um, things that you don't hear in every single uh, murder case. As far as the other stuff goes, perpetual puzzles, Oak Island is in there. We still don't know what happened there. We still don't know. Uh, Dyatlov is the last story in there, and that's been much covered. Dyatlov Pass, people think Yeti, people think all kinds of different things. Uh, some people say, man, it was just an avalanche. I think it could be something. This is where my three out of ten woo comes in. Something was not quite right there. Why, if there's a an avalanche happening, why on earth do people slash their way out of a tent prior to the avalanche hitting? You know, uh, they left the tent. They left the tent with their shoes not on, their clothes not on, and ran in different directions. What the heck is going on to make somebody want to do that? I have no idea. Teddy Hadiska, who is one of the leading researchers on that, uh, and has been on this show a couple of times to talk mm -hmm. about the Dietlob Pass incident. She believes that it was a tree that fell, a, a big tree that fell, and because they, they all heard the noise, they scrambled to get out. That's hmm. what she believes. And now, do I, buy that? do I buy that story? Not I really. It doesn't, it's... Not, not really, but apparently she's more in-depth on that than I am. But then again, it's such a beautiful conspiratorial story is uh is it's really hard to decipher what really happened i mean there's only nine people who know mm -hmm. and they're all dead they're all dead every single one of them um i kind of like the theory that uh they were killed by uh the russians uh, because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time and thought they might be a group of spies. That's that's one of the more interesting theories that I've heard of as far as Dyatlov goes, uh, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Give us one more story from your book. I don't want to give it all away. Okay. I, need, I need one more. One more. Um, there's... I, one of the things that really affected me when I was a kid, and I talk about this in the book, is um, I was big into space. I loved NASA. I loved all that stuff. And I remember they set up the TV. It was This was before internet, obviously. I am much older. I would have been in high school in the 80s. So I remember them setting up a TV in the library so everybody could watch the Space Shuttle Challenger launch. And uh, for us, it was around uh, just a little bit before the start of school. If I remember correctly, I might be misremembering, but I remember I got there just after the launch had happened. I, it might have been around lunchtime or something, but I got there just after the launch had happened and there was all these long faces in the library. 
And I said, well, what happened? And they said, it blew up. So somewhere in between me being at home and walking to school, the space shuttle Challenger exploded. So I kind of wanted to have uh, a bit of a look at that because again, it's another story that I really felt connected to. It's interesting uh, in Netflix is it's, I guess Netflix has had the same ideas that I have had because a few of the stories that are in my book are now series on Netflix, or true crime or dark history series on Netflix. And they came up, um, uh, in the re in recent months. So I don't know, maybe Netflix was reading my mail or something like that. I don't think I'm that important, but um, they are stories that are compelling and need to be told. So uh, I tell them in a smaller, uh, more like 3000 words, whereas Netflix is expanding on them with video and all that kind of stuff. But if you want to read my book's the one to do it, but <laughs> of course it is. Yeah, of course it is. You know, I I wouldn't expect anything less. Right. You know, but let's go to your podcast for a minute because you have some incredible stories on here that I would love for you to share with our audience if, uh -oh. you, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. And, and you did a story of the 24 Canadians who were and who passed away on September 11th. Yeah. You know, a horrific day for everybody out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and the reason I did that story was not so much to talk about the death and destruction that happened. Obviously, I have to tell that story. I have to talk about Canadians dying uh, during that event. Um, but what what my real take was, was uh, how Canada stepped up uh, to really help the people who were involved in that situation. Uh, I mean, there were hundreds of planes still in the air and they were all told, nope, you can't come to the States. So they have to go somewhere. And a lot of them were rerouted to different airports here in Canada. And all the airports that they were rerouted to were the ones that were far away from the large cities. So uh, any city that had an airport within it, like Toronto, no, nope, there's no flights going there a big portion of them went to Gander places. Uh, the Gander is the middle of nowhere. Like it is the furthest East that you can go in Canada. And it's a tiny little airport. I landed there uh, in 1985 when I was on my way to Paris, it was just like a little hop we did before from Nova Scotia before we went to, to Heathrow and then to Paris. But it is a tiny, tiny, tiny place. There is, nothing there other than a bunch of uh, people to support essentially this airport and a bit of the fishing industry at the time. But all of a sudden, the population of this little town is doubled by people who need a place to stay who are on these airplanes from 9-11. And these people from Newfoundland stepped up and said, not only will we put you up in schools and in gymnasiums and all that kind of stuff. But if there's overflow, come on and live in our house. We'll feed you for the next few days. We'll house you. We'll give you a place to stay and uh, we'll treat you like family. That's the kind of stuff that I really find is important is what a community's reaction is to a situation. So that's why I, I love telling that story because I can put that, We've all heard the uh, heard the stories about the hijackers, Osama bin Laden, uh, everybody else who was involved, the story of Flight 93, all of that. But how much do you know about the aftermath? Not a lot. There's been a play about it, a musical, but uh, <laughs> uh, I haven't seen that myself. I don't know. I don't really like musicals that much. I thought... Uh, well, what is it? The uh, West Side Story was unwatchable. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, not a big fan of Glee here. But anyway. No, you shouldn't be. No. <laughs> you know, there's certain things in life you shouldn't be a fan of. Glee, Coldplay, <laughs> driving a Prius, and so yeah. What about Nickelback, though? I like Nickelback. Okay. I'll leave you alone. I do. I know I, she. Has, I even admit that publicly. There you I go. Go back. 
you and have I'm, a you have a lot of guitars, so I assume that you play, and they're not just I, decoration. I am actually uh, in guitar lessons. Oh, nice! I, I am in guitar lessons, and and today I was learning Day Tripper. Ah, one of my favorite Beatles tunes. I love yes. Day Tripper. Yes, uh, and I love it. Like I, I, if you want to talk Beatles, I know a little bit about the Beatles. Uh, I love that they use the song in the background. You can hear them when they're singing day tripper they're also singing frere jaca the uh the french tune so next time you listen to uh day tripper listen and you'll hear the beatles singing frere jaca behind i will yeah behind the lyrics of of day tripper if we actually studied the lyrics of of a lot of music out there mm -hmm. it's amazing what we could learn you know oh, yeah. like like Sammy Hagar writing about his ET contact mm -hmm. through. Have you ever looked at the lyrics of Love Walks In? No. Nope. I'm with Van Halen. Nope. It is literally about the lady, the female alien who comes down to take him. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Billy Corgan from Smashing Pumpkins has written songs about that. Um, you know, I mean, there's a ton of artists who've written about their strange encounters. And now there's a book that needs to be written. Oh, that, that is a really interesting book. <laughs> that would make an interesting book talking about uh, lyrics and where they come from and, and sort of the supernatural paranormal stuff that's behind some yeah. of them. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, uh, Led Zeppelin were well known as people who are trying to raise demons and devil worshipers and that kind of stuff. So I'm sure we could include that in, in stories about the oh, absolutely. The, honestly, that's a book I would love to write. There's do an it. Idea, there's an idea for you and I, Mike. Yeah, let's do it, man. I'm totally into it. If if it involves music and weirdness, I'm totally I'm down for it, hundred percent. That would be so fun. Oh yeah, I, I think I think we should do it. I really do. I think it would be a a fantastic, fantastic type of book that's out there but on dark poutine your podcast you know you have one of the most popular podcasts in canada dealing with the strange and unknown and and true crimes and everything and i, I really suggest that a lot of people go out there and really really check out the mark you were leaving on the podcast industry regarding it i'd like to talk about some of these stories that that are very interesting here's one from a long time ago, going back to 1963. Mm -hmm. And this is an episode you just did a couple of weeks ago regarding the October crisis that not a lot of Canadians, let alone Americans, know about this. Right. Yeah. I mean, the October crisis is, uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing. Like, uh, there were, there was seven years of terrorism in Quebec. Uh, bombings, like w uh, every few weeks, a bomb would go off and blow off someone's hand or, uh, you know, blow up near a school or, or something like that. And it, it was this group of people who wanted to essentially have Quebec separate from Canada and become a communist state a la Cuba, because they were in league with, with Fidel Castro and all that kind of stuff. So they, they saw Quebec uh, leaving Canada and becoming this complete communist socialist state, which is just like, that's ridiculous. Well, like, what are you talking about? And th they ended up killing two people. One they say was accidentally, but uh, you know, uh, there was, there were other people who died over the, over the course of the whole thing. But uh, one person they said was killed accidentally when he fought back. Uh, during his kidnap so yeah the FLQ is a very very interesting story and not a lot of Canadians who are uh, my age and younger know about that I mean I'm 50 years old and this happened uh, this happened just over you know when we were kids yeah we were kids we were little kids so uh, it wasn't some. I wasn't watching the news I was busy watching the cookie monster and Sesame Street you know like um, so people who are younger than us don't even have any awareness of this. And this is why another reason why I like to tell these stories, because 
people say, oh, Canada's so boring. No, it ain't. Like, really, if you, <laughs> if you really look, we have some of the most interesting stories out there. And the reason I think that they don't get the attention is we are like uh, an attic apartment on top of a giant mansion that has a screaming party in it all the time. Like all the noise that's coming out of the United States, all their money, all their people um, pushing entertainment, pushing their true crime, pushing Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, all these kind of things out there into the universe. And where are these squeaky little Canadians talking about, well, what about Paul Bernardo? And what about, you know, uh, Willie Picton? What about that? You know, there's stories here that are just as fascinating. Very true. Very true. So the fact that I, I don't think a lot of people really understand that, you know, in, in a subverse way, you know, there is still a separatist movement in mm -hmm. Quebec to, to separate from Canada. Yep. Regarding, you know, whether it's politics, whether it's, you know, the fact that they haven't won a Stanley Cup since 1993. I really don't know. Yeah. What what the uh, issue is? They should have never moved out of the forum and caused the curse. The That's price all. of Putin, she too high. Pretty much, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. But but you know that is something that it is still a very black eye in Canadian history. I mean, not as not as uh, much of a black eye as what it, we're finding out through all the the uh, the massacres at the residential schools right. where flags have been flying at half staff across this country for past few months and well deservedly so but i mean let, let me ask you about that because that is a sensitive subject have you looked into the massacres at the at the uh, uh the catholic schools uh they were actually catholic and united church was involved in in some of these schools as well so um the catholics shouldn't get all the all the grief for it but yeah i have looked into it quite deeply um, I've talked to some people who had relatives who were in residential schools. And the reason that I haven't covered it on my show is it's one of those stories where I feel like I need to, if I'm going to tell it, I'm a white guy. I am one of the colonials, you know, like I, I am, uh, I'm just a dude who it is not really my story to tell. I want to have it told in the right way. So what I would do is if I'm going to tell this on my show, I would bring people who have had these experiences onto the show to tell it themselves, because I think we need to amplify those voices and have people who have been through these things and have a real understanding of what it was like to be scooped up from your home when you were a little kid in during the sixties and seventies and fired into a residential school or put into a white family uh, to deprogram you to, uh, as they say, to take the Indian out of the child, which is, is horrible. You know, they, like it's, it is actual genocide. So I have some very strong opinions on it, as you can see, but um, yeah, I, I grew up knowing kids who had been scooped. There were kids who looked different than me in, school throughout elementary school right and i'll give you to hold that thought okay we're gonna go to break here at the bottom of the hour on spaced out radio mike brown from the dark poutine podcast true crime is the subject tonight on spaced out radio we'll continue right after this All right, Prairie Fire, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm getting hungry. We, we, do, we do not talk COVID ever on this show, all right? We do, we've we never talked COVID, so I'm not sure what what the issue is, Prairie Fire. Is that true? What, oh, so now he's going soon. No, no, I didn't say, are we talking Biden? Are we talking Trump? Are we talking politics? No, we're talking about events that happen. You have to be able to separate the two. Yeah. All right. Don't don't try and, and shit on my parade on this. All right. Because I am able as a host to tell the difference. Sorry. No worries. Yeah, people people get there's And that's another reason why I don't tell those stories so 
readily is because they're very polarizing. A lot of people feel uh, very strongly one way or the other about these these uh, these topics. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to bite my tongue right now. Good man. <laughs> it's <laughs> I've had to do that like in in our Facebook group there are so many times where I just want to hit the nuke button and I just it's better that I don't, you know, because you know, I've got the big voice there. I'm the I'm the administrator of the group and if if I want to, I could I can make things go boom, but it's often better for me to just keep my pie hole shut. Events are not politics. Political events, I mean, then we would never talk UFOs, pra Prairie Fire. All right? You're nitpicking right now. You're a good person. Let's not go down this road. You're not going to win. Sorry. <laughs> no worry. Hello, uh, Sarah Colantonio. Welcome to our chat room. And there goes my damn... Uh, video card again mm. i'm having one of those nights right now are you yeah yeah uh i don't lester i don't talk a lot about the picton pig farm because uh we know the story of what's going on but there are from what i have heard from from people who i have talked to there is still a and i don't know what it's about but apparently there is still a lot of investigation still going around that entire case. So there you go. Well, Prairie Fire, maybe we're not the show for you. How about that? Maybe we're not the show. When I say I don't want politics, this is the last time I'm going to talk about it because I'm getting fired up and and, and everything. You don't want Dave fired up. You really don't. All right. But what, I, what I'm saying here is we don't talk political discourse or politics or elections or anything like that. Some of the topics will have a political side to it. We cannot get around that. So if you're going to try and catch me in one of those aha, gotcha moments, this isn't the show for you then anymore. I'm not trying to be a prick, okay? Even though, you know, Bart will say that I am, but that's just the way it is. I don't do aha, gotcha moments, okay? There's different realms of everything. If we didn't talk... you. By your stance, we can't talk UFOs, we can't talk true crime, we can't talk military, we can't talk finance on, on the effects of ET contact, we can't talk anything. We don't have a show. So don't pull the aha, caught you moment on me. That doesn't work with me. That sets me off like that. It's a trigger thing, man. Now my fucking blood pressure is up. <laughs> Uh, maybe have a smoke. Sorry, Mike. No, no worries. It's all good in the hood. Mark Rademacher, how are you, buddy? Good to see you. We got about one minute here. Do they think? Do you think the pig farm had cover up? Well, that's an interesting story. That that is. Yeah, I have some opinions on that. I have some knowledge on that too. Well, I don't know how much knowledge, but it's what people told me. I wish I had more time. I'm coming down to the Lower Mainland this weekend. I'd like to meet up for lunch with you, bud. Yeah, like when, whenever. Like, I I work out of my house, so whenever you're close by, just let me know and we'll do it. Yeah, no kidding. I got to get you to meet up with Merle too. Yeah, he added me as a friend on Facebook. Yeah. I don't know him know him yet, but Good I I really want to have a conversation with him. Maybe we should all get together and just yeah. shoot the poo, as it were. I'll call you tomorrow on that. Here we go, guys. Okay.
We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for getting to know us. We really do appreciate those aha moments in this show. Want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show and others, check out our free archives. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot, reading up on Shirky Poo's Newswire. We got swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. From the Dark Poutine Podcast, which can be found at CuriousCast.ca. All you got to do is Google it. It's one of Canada's most popular podcasts. We have Mike Brown here with us talking about a bunch of true crime stories that are going on around Canada and around the world. We want to say hello, Mike, for coming back in. How you been doing, buddy? Uh, pretty good. Uh, I'm amazed that I'm able to stay awake and uh, uh, coherent maybe at this time of day. I don't know. Like You're I'm West usually, Coast, man. I'm usually chilling and chilling on my couch. I'm not used to I'm not used to running my lips at this time of night. <laughs> well, I realize that, but man, you got to give up the matlock uh, addiction. Okay? The matlock. <laughs> the you know, it's over. It's been over for a while. My my new co-host Matthew loves Murder She Wrote. Oh, it's yeah, no. uh, like he is big time into Murder She Wrote. What was it that hit- horrible, horrible Canadian one? Uh, it was like back in the like 1920s or something. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, it was yeah, I can't. yeah, it was not good. But yeah, I don't I don't think I watched it. It was probably something on CBC. Uh, but you can always tell a Canadian show by how how uh, terrible the lighting is. I don't know what it is. Like, what is it by about Canadian uh, film crews? We, you know, I used to work on them, but. When it's a Canadian produced show, for some reason, all the rules go out the window and things look terrible. Yeah, and it looks like it's filmed in 1980s film. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It doesn't have that good HDMI or mm. HD quality, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, but I have a lot of people in our chat room who are asking about the Picton case. Yeah. I, I was really trying to stay away from this one, but you know what? If the audience want in our chat room wants to hear about it, I'm gonna I'm gonna follow that that line because I got a lot of people asking about it. So let's get into the case, if you don't mind. I know you're very familiar with it. Yeah, I mean, um, I haven't covered it on the show yet um, because that's one of those big cases. Um, because I tend to focus on victims so much, there were 49 known people uh, involved in in this that were victims of of Mr. Picton. And, uh, I don't want, I like doing a show. I would essentially be doing a really long show about 49 people who were murdered. Uh, so I haven't quite figured out how I want to tackle it yet, but we can definitely talk about it. I, I, like we talked about earlier, I lived in Maple Ridge at the time that all this went down. And so I'm familiar with the property and all that kind of stuff because it was behind the Home Depot that we shopped at. But uh, I also had people who worked for me in the film industry. I was an assistant location manager uh, for a time in the film industry. And uh, one of the gentlemen who I hired uh, as a production assistant uh, was security at Piggy's Palace for years during those big parties that involved uh, motorcycle enthusiasts that wear a particular patch on their back. And uh, it was pretty interesting, some of the stories that he told me about that. And from him, uh, I heard something that I had also heard something else, which was really interesting, that there was a room at Piggy's Palace that was set up with video equipment and plastic all over the room. So the The belief is, and I don't know if this is true, I'm just saying what people have told me, the belief is that they were making, somebody was making snuff films there at Picton's. And whether his brother was involved or not, his brother's name keeps coming up over and over and over again as somebody who people think need a harder look at. Um, I don't know. I don't know. All I know is uh, that... He had a brother and 
he's an interesting character. Uh, his brother also apparently ran somebody over and killed them at some point. So the whole family has a very, very interesting history. But I do think there might be some, uh, some truth to some other things that were not so nice were happening there that involved these women who were murdered. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I know about this is that I heard about the snuff films as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it is something that that is very, very um, heartbreaking because a lot of these women were First Nations women. Yep. They were all, for the most part, addicts yep. on Vancouver's downtown east side. Mm -hmm. My ex-sister-in-law, God rest her soul, she passed away from uh, an overdose and HIV. Uh, she lived on the downtown east side. Yeah. And during one of her sober times, her and I sat down and had a conversation about this. And I asked her point blank, did you know any of these girls who went missing? And she goes, yeah. She goes, I knew about 10 or 15 of them. And she was, she was literally stating that everybody was telling both the Vancouver Police Department and members of the RCMP that these people are missing. There is somebody taking these girls and we're mm -hmm. never seeing them again. And basically the police were sloughing off the concerns of these, these ladies on the downtown east side because they're considered waste of time, yeah, a waste of space, a waste of oxygen. The, mean, sy the system looks at them as disposable. They're disposable absolutely. people. They're, uh, as you know, for lack of a better word, uh, um, I don't want to bring up the Nazis, but the way the way that they spoke of a certain people who they believed were less than human, they called them untermensch, which is under people, like less than people. And that's the way uh, these uh, indigenous women and girls are are treated. Um, I talk about it in an upcoming show, actually, next week's show, I'm tackling one of the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls cases from New Brunswick, actually. But what I bring up in the show is uh, it's, there's a thing called missing white woman syndrome. Uh, the news and media are way more interested in Gabby Petito than they are any of the people who uh, are of color and go missing and end up murdered. So, um, the statistic, which I found was shocking, in Canada, uh, a, an Indigenous woman is 27 times less likely to have any news story or anything about her um, if she goes missing. 27 times less likely than that of a white woman. So it's it's disturbing and i mean those are statistics that it's not just something i pulled out of my hat that's that's a statistic by a, a company that looked into this in a big way so um just the fact that these kind of things are taking place in our country and uh if i can have maybe even a little make a little difference by trying to amplify these stories in even a small way, I, I guess I'm doing the right thing. Very true. Very true. And, and, you know, when it comes to Piggy's palace, there is still some question as to whether or not there is still an investigation going on because of the way that, that the police, a botched the story, but because mm -hmm. of the magnitude of this, they're still trying to, uh, close cases of missing people that they are wondering whether or not Willie Picton actually murdered them or not. He's been charged with 49. They believe he's murdered over 62 yeah. uh, prostitutes from Van the Vancouver's downtown East side. I mean, this is ugly. He was only ever convicted of six as well. So, yeah. so this is the thing, like all these, these other um, 40, 43 people who he was charged with murdering, their families get no, I don't want to use the word closure, but they get no no facts. They don't get any sort of information about what happened to their child or their daughter or their sister. You know, it's just like, okay, we, we charged them with the ones that were going to be the easiest to, uh, 
to get them for. Uh, and all the rest of them, well, we don't really have to charge them because that's going to cost money to investigate those. So at the end of the day, the bottom line is what determines whether or not we ever hear the truth about what happened at Piggy's Palace. Well, the other part, too, that it has to be brought up, we really will never know how many people he killed because the family originally sold a bunch of their property for, mm -hmm. to development for millions of dollars. Yeah. And there, there are million-dollar homes in that area of, of subdivisions. I believe they, they had like 10, 15 acres mm -hmm. and they sold a big portion of it. And, nobody, right. and nobody knows how many bodies, because for, not to sound grotesque here, but this is the truth of what was happening. He would, Willie Picton would put these victims after they were dead, we hope, through a wood chipper. Mm -hmm. He would feed his pigs on his farm some of the, the the sludge that came out from the wood chipper, and yeah. then he would go spray the wood chipper all over his property and bury it with dirt. Yeah, and, and he he also took some body parts. They are sure that he took body parts to uh, West Coast Reduction, which is uh, a, a it's a factory essentially downtown that renders animal fat and animal parts to make mm -hmm. uh, to make different products. So. Um, you'll know that you're near West Coast Reduction down on Powell Street when the smell hits you. Uh, but um, so this guy was, was he comes off as dumb, dumb farmer guy. But uh, if he is that way, did he have help? Was somebody giving him a hand, maybe chatting in his ear about like, this is what you need to do to get rid of things? It's really curious if he's if he's so stupid and has such a low IQ, how did he get away with what he did for so long? It can't just have been the fact that no one was paying attention to these women going missing. There had to be other things. Well, and, and that's exactly it. I mean, we don't know that total could be 80, could mm -hmm. be 100 because we'll ne because that one area has been subdivided. We'll never know how many body parts are under that ground. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, that is a graveyard. I, and I still can't believe that they built houses there. They should have condemned those houses. Well, if you look at I mean, you've all, we've all seen the movie Poltergeist. Uh, I don't know if I want to live in a house that is buried uh, or that is built on top of people who... Uh, were murdered by Willie Picton. I, I don't think I'd be too keen to live in one of those places. Uh, but, you know, um, it's amazing that Picton and Gary Ridgway were both operating in the Pacific Northwest at exactly the same time. Right. And there's, there's also some speculation that those two might have known each other somehow. Yes. Uh, so, you know, like, it's pretty fascinating that, you know, I don't know if that is true, but you hear some pretty wild theories out there around this stuff and their victim profile is almost exactly the same. So who's to say that, you know, maybe, maybe they were having like a little serial killer coffee clutch. One of the more grotesque parts of this story is the fact that they raised those hogs for slaughter. Mm-hmm. Those hogs were fed human remains. Yes. And they were raised for slaughter and sold as meat, bacon, mm -hmm. everything Hot to dogs. Lo to local people. Yeah. And were there any lawsuits that came out regarding people? Because they had they, they actually on the media, I remember them putting out a call mm -hmm. for people who had bought meat there mm -hmm. to go get tested for all sorts of diseases. Right. I mean, yeah, I don't know how that works. I, I'm not a doctor, obviously, nor am I a scientist. I only play one on TV. But um, I, I really don't know what legally anybody could do with that. Like, who are they going to sue? It looks like uh, the police uh, or at least the federal government appropriated everything that belonged to that in that area. So. I don't know. There's there's no one left to sue, really. Yeah, but you could have went after the family. I guess so. 
I guess so. I don't know. I haven't looked into it that deeply. Comment from Sandra in our chat room that kind of caught me off guard here. She says her cousin was one of Clifford Olson's victims. Oh, gosh. I never knew. Wow. That. wow. I never yeah, knew. that's that's horrific. Horrible. Yeah. I mean, Olson was a monster, bar none. I mean, they did the... Uh, so the person who came up with this psychopath scale, Robert Hare, uh, the most famous uh, doctor, a psychologist, psychiatric doctor who uh, created the psychopath scale, is actually from here in Vancouver. He's, uh, uh, he was a professor. He's retired now, Robert Hare, uh, at UBC. And when Clifford Olson was given the test of where on the psychopathic scale he was, uh, he scored the highest score that they had ever seen. So, and this guy was, you know, he didn't care male, female, what he was on a roll. He killed essentially all the, all these people within uh, an 11 month period. And, uh, he wouldn't have stopped had he not been caught, like you said before, sort of by mistake. Did you ever look into the case? This one kind of hits home for me because mm -hmm. uh, I was a young man in Abbotsford when when this was going on with the case of Terry Driver. Yep. Yep. My former co-host actually went to high school with him and <laughs> and uh, went uh, watched the movie Halloween 3 at Terry Driver's house. So tell our audience who Terry Driver is. So Terry Driver was uh, a gentleman who uh, decided that he would try and rape and kill two young girls from Abbotsford one night. So he essentially popped out of the bushes with a baseball bat and beat them both senseless. One of them later died after he left her in the Vetter River, and the other one escaped to a nearby hospital where she, her life was saved, even though she was really badly beaten. Um, but it, the case, what made that case interesting is that Driver um, would call the police and taunt them saying, I'm going to do this again. Uh, and how he was caught, it was crazy. Like some of the stuff he did was really, really crazy. He stole the headstone of one of his victims and put it on a, a, a radio station's car on the, you know, the marked car from the radio station. You know, what was interesting about that. Mm -hmm. There were no scratches on the hood. No. And to lift that's a heavy, it, yeah. To lift that, you're going to lunge that as mm -hmm. one person, and it's going to cause denting and scratching on the hood of the vehicle. And there wasn't. And I actually, when I was in broadcasting school, mm -hmm. covered a couple of days of his trial. Yeah. And it was very interesting because his two brothers shaved his their heads, and and uh, I believe their mustaches, their facial hair in support of terry yeah and, and what was really weird not to make accusations here but one of the the of the first uh sketches that came out from police actually looked like terry's brother hmm. yeah yeah it's it's really fascinating and some people think that he didn't act alone in that and that obviously if if he would have had to been superhuman to have gotten that uh, gravestone up onto that car. Uh, it's, it's really fascinating. Um, but how he was caught was that the police released the tapes of him saying, I'm going to do it again. And his mother overheard them and turned him in. So his own mom said, yeah, that's my son. His wife was my banker. Oh, good Lord. Wow. Yeah. Someone asked how the how the pig farm guy got caught. I mean, it was a long and co convoluted thing, but essentially uh, there were people who he had tried to do in, and uh, it was through uh, uh, a geographic profiler named Kim Rosmo was instrumental in having Willie Picton caught. Essentially, he 
developed uh, a geographic profile of where the killer lived. And so they focused in that area and uh, on people who were suspects from that area. And Picton was one and made enough mistakes that they finally got him. That actually reminds me of what my former sister-in-law stated about that. They knew about the farm. Mm -hmm. Everybody was told. All the girls were told on the streets. Yep, stay away. Stay away from anybody who wants to take you out of town mm -hmm. or, or take you back to a farm. Yep. And that's where Picton ended up changing a lot of his vehicles. He was borrowing friends' vehicles in order to go pick up his, his victims because his truck was recognized mm -hmm. by a lot of these girls. So, I mean, it was, it was amazing. Uh, there's another person who's been doing some interesting things that is on the police radar uh, up in Salmon Arm, in the Salmon Arm area. I can't remember the guy's name right now, right off the top of my head, but um, it looks like he has been doing similar things on his farm. And, uh, there was one person that they did find buried on a farm near Salmon Arm. And uh, uh, even though they can't prove that he did anything, there were human remains found there. So it's really interesting that uh, here maybe this guy is trying to replicate what Picton was up to. One of the biggest stories that everybody talks about is the Highway of Tears. Yeah. Do you believe that there are several serial killers working that? Or do you believe that there is one that's been doing it for years? I believe there are several. Um, I think Billy Jack Fowler was actually a really good suspect in a few of them. Um, obviously, uh, Cody Lejabakov, who was caught and convicted for three of those, um, Canada's youngest serial killer at 19 years old, um, the only reason he was caught is because the cops were driving down the road and saw him speed out of a, a logging road, going like a bat out of hell, and they were wondering what the heck was he doing down the logging road. So when they went to look, they found a little girl's body. So that's the only way he was he was caught was just because, you know, um, he did something dumb. And uh, he'd probably still be active today in that area had he not been busted at that time. But there are, there's enough proof or enough sort of uh, clues that lead to Billy Jack Fowler. If you want to Google that guy, he was an interesting cat and a truck driver, long haul truck driver between Alaska and uh, the United States. So he would drive right through Canada and along that highway of tears. And he was busted uh, uh, down there for murder. So, and he had quote unquote admitted to, making some of the killings along the highway of tears, but it was never proven and he was never charged with any of them. Wow. Well, we have you for another 30 minutes here, Mike on spaced out radio as we're about to close out hour number two and then come into hour number three here on the mighty SOR talking true crime all night long from Mike Brown from the P dark poutine podcast he's got his first book about to come out november 2nd murder madness and mayhem 25 tales of true crime and dark history this is going to be one for your shelves trust me on this one and we'd love to see you get it you have a, a couple of stories from your podcast we're going to get to right after this and don't forget at the bottom of the hour it's dave 101 i'm gonna get rant go rant on nasa now wanting to get into the UFO game. We'll be back on Spaced Out Radio right after this. It's about time <laughs> that they're getting involved. Oh, yeah. I am. I am so pissed off about it. Why? Because it makes the UFO world look like fools. Oh, no. It really does, in my opinion. How so? Well, when they when they start coming out, and, and the guy who is now running NASA is a real champion for um, for getting into the UFO game. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, whether it's Donna Hare or other astronauts from Edgar Mitchell and others who have come out and said that they saw uh, UFOs flying, you know, I mean... 
they know about it. They've known about it for decades, ever since the Apollo missions. And that's what I'm going to rant about. Hmm. Ranting is good. Yeah. Just pisses me off. It does. I find it very insulting. Mm -hmm. And I shouldn't, you know, I shouldn't take it personally, but I do. Wow. Some of the comments are funny. There's the trolls. Oh, where's my, where is he? Oh, Barther, come on. You know the, what makes the world look like fools? Or the UFO world make look Oh, yeah. I can't even read. <laughs> I can't even read it right now. Mm hmm. <laughs> look at that. Barther, that's terrible. I've never been probed. Oh, well. What's wrong with that? Maybe some people are into that. I don't know. Not from aliens. That'd be terrible. <laughs> Do you have any? Have you studied uh, the Long Island serial killer? Nope. Eddie wants to know. <laughs> nope. Yeah, it's only about thirty-eight hundred miles away. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, and, and not a Canadian case. I mean, I've watched the documentaries and that kind of stuff, but I haven't really looked into it. Right. Let's see here. Where are we going? Well, thanks then, Lizzie Borden. You guys are my husband's favorite podcast. Oh, well, that's, that's nice. Fun. Thank you. Appreciate that. You're worth three claps. Yeah, oh, you can get four. four. Yeah, I'll give her an extra one. Have you ever <laughs> looked at the Todd C's case? No. No. We'll save that one for Butch and Lon Strickler. <laughs> yes. Spaghetti, you missed us talking about the pig farm. Hey, Kurt Seltzer with a splash of lime. How are you? <laughs> a splash of lime. Yeah. So I'm here till 1130, the bottom oh, of the hour. 1130, yeah. Groovy. We're going to get Bart L. A. Chad Smith t shirt with a wrench on it. That's what we're going to do. Payback. Getting a Chad Smith t shirt. Barther, you, you are one sick guy. You must be working European hours tonight. You have to be. Have to be. All these cases are so not Canadian smiley face kit murders. No, I haven't really looked That's into that. That's yeah, weird. it's very strange. Pat Coor in Australia. Can you let us know if we're alive tomorrow? <laughs> Since it's Friday where you are. Someone taught me how to say it, uh, speak Australian. You have to say worms and birds. Worms and birds. Hello, that's a nice lady. Worms and birds. Or you just go to Whistler to learn the lingo. Oh, right, exactly. They're all there skiing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Body technician, good morning to you. Ah, there is Super Ben from UFO Garage. Look oh, right on. on. 
Look what I'm wearing. <laughs> Just amazing. I just got this today. This is so comfy. I'm wearing this to work tomorrow. Oh, there you go. Uh, yeah, I'm wearing it to work. I got the pillow. Uh, the back end of the pillow made uh, Mrs. SOR laugh quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> big thank you to Snakes, Mark, Happy, Chad, Simon, Apollo, Jason, Cat Chaser, and Smithy for the super chats. It's a great way to support what we do on this show. Here we go with the third and final hour. Don't forget to stick around for Dave 101 as well. Here we go. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. We want to say hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do us the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Cucurbitophobia, cucurbitophobia, which means a fear of pumpkins. Yes, the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot, reading up on Shirky Poo's Newswire, and, of course, checking out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. And on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, we introduce Mike Brown. He's got a brand new book out, which is called, well, it's not out yet. It's coming out November 2nd. Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, 25 Tales of True Crime and Dark History. And that is going to be a fantastic book to add to your library, which I highly recommend. And of course, he is the host of the Dark Poutine podcast, one of the most popular podcasts in Canada today. Mike, welcome back. Hello. Good to have you here, my friend. It's good, it's good to be back. I was just thinking, how on earth do you do this night after night after night? I'm getting hungry and I'm getting tired. I'm not lonely, but I mean, you know, holy smokes, you really put some effort in, my friend. Well, you know, uh, every now and again, you have to live the dream, and we are <laughs> living the dream here. I want to go ahead. I used to say that uh, when I was cleaning toilets, when I was uh, a production assistant on the movies, uh, especially on Wicker Man, after I was covered in spaghetti after a particular uh, terrible incident between myself, a garbage bag, and a dumpster, I used to say, live in the dream, my friends, live in the dream. Absolutely. Absolutely, my friend. It, it's really good to good to see you here, and thank you so much for joining us. We have one of our radio stations that covers us in Mississauga, Ontario, as uh, we absolutely love broadcasting on Saga 960 in the night. And thank you so much for tuning us in. And you actually did an episode of the Dark Poutine podcast back in August of this year mm -hmm. about a case back in 1973, early 1974, about a couple of murders of young women there. Mm -hmm. And which, which case was that? Good Lord. <laughs> that was the monster in Mississauga. Oh, Candace Dickey and Nada Novak. Yeah, um, that was an interesting one, especially, you know, uh, just the offender was was super interesting in that case. I mean, I don't really recall a lot of a lot about our cases because I do uh, a case every week. So calling me out on a specific one is probably not a good idea because don't really remember all the details get pushed out of my brain from one case to the next well you know what i understand that but you're the true crime guy no no so, <laughs> am i <laughs> well i hope that you are do you have yeah. a favorite case that you've covered um i think probably one of the the ones that i f i feel uh i really got into covering 
was the case of Justin Burke, who uh, murdered the Mounties in Mon uh, Moncton, New Brunswick. Um, somehow I stumbled across uh, a, um, a PowerPoint presentation that had been used at his sentencing, and it, in it included um, 911 calls and all this information that wasn't out there in the media. So I really got to do a good job at covering that case in a way that nobody else had up to that point. So um, I was really happy that I could do that. Uh, another case that has really stuck with me and is actually one of the cases in my book is the case of Elisa Lamb, the young lady who went missing from uh, the Cecil Hotel in Los Angeles and ended up uh, being found later uh, in... Let's yeah, talk about that one. Let's go into detail on that one. Yeah, because uh, it, it was really interesting. The what made that case interesting is the video that went around. That was essentially this girl goes missing. They're looking for her. Cops are looking for her. So they go through the surveillance video at the Cecil Hotel, and there, on the night that she had gone missing, was Elisa Lamb in and out of the elevator, and it looked like she was playing hide and seek with somebody in the elevator. She's later found days later in a water tank atop the Cecil hotel. And some of the members or some of the people who were living at the hotel or just staying at the hotel, long time and short time guests noticed that there was a funny taste to the water that uh, they were drinking and funny smell to the water as they were showering. And sure enough, when uh, the maintenance man went up, he found, Alyssa Lamb there in the water tank. So very creepy story. Uh, a lot of it has been, there's been some speculation that she was seeing a ghost because there's some interesting stories around the Cecil Hotel that perhaps there was something else there in the hotel with her, um, some sort of entity of some kind. But when it comes down to an explanation it appeared that she had not been taking the medication that she'd been prescribed by her doctor for uh, her bipolar disorder. And she may or may not have been having a psychotic episode at the time, which led her to having hallucinations and thinking things were there that weren't. But that's not, that's not the woo that you guys love here on this show, right? Well, so, but there are a lot of questions about that, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, number one, I thought it was absolutely classless of the television show Ghost Hunters to actually go in there and try and communicate with her. It's only, right. it's yeah. only been seven years. And I and I knew there was a number of people in Vancouver who were pretty upset that that show was going to do a two-hour special, Halloween yeah. special on that a year ago. Yeah. Uh, but number two, I, I really felt that there was something different to that. She was known as a meek girl, not a very strong girl. Right. And those plates that are allegedly covering the, the water uh, uh, towers on top of the hotel were relatively heavy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and add to the fact that her, you know, she was found in there naked. Right. Uh, but that's, that's something that happens when, when people are drowning. They will disrobe uh, for some reason. I don't know why that is, but... Uh, that's that's something that happens in some drownings. People will disrobe. It's a very strange case. There's lots of weird stuff around it. I was a little disgusted too that those guys would do that. Um, it was a little insensitive, and you know, uh, she was a human being after all, and a university student here at UBC. And I don't know if you're familiar with the band the Zolas uh, yeah. from from here in Vancouver. They're they're sort of a, an alternative. Uh, band, but they did a song called Ancient Mars. And uh, if you can, just Google Ancient Mars, the Zolas, and you can listen to uh, the lead singer's take on seeing, hoping to see Alyssa Lamb in the, in the, in the book stacks at the university library there at UBC, but knowing he won't. Uh, the video for the song actually is sort of roughly based around a young uh, woman traveling and ends up in the water. So 
it's a it's pretty fascinating. It's it's been one of those cases that have moved a lot of people. I used to drive by the, her parents' restaurant on the way home when I lived in Burnaby. So I remember when they had all kinds of flowers and that kind of stuff outside uh, after she had been found. It was terrible. That poor family. Yeah, terrible. I mean, and the thing is, you can't do anything about it. No. The, media, the media takes over or reality mm -hmm. TV takes over and it's all about numbers. Right. You know. Yeah. And I mean, we did see that recently. I mentioned it previously with the Gabby Petito case and her, her boyfriend with the unfortunate last name, Laundry, Brian Laundry. Um, uh, you know, she, she and he were sort of YouTube stars. They're social media influencers and uh, they're on a trip together. And he, one of them, Gabby goes missing, ends up, she was murdered. And then he goes missing and turns out he's dead. So, and this is all very recent, but there's been so much focus on that case that uh, it's really kind of drowned out a lot of the other cases. And why? Because it's a blue eyed, blonde haired, pretty young girl who was a social media influencer. So they know, hey, we already have a built in audience for this. So let's beat this to death uh, for want of a better term. Very true. Very true. You know, when you look at it, I mean, has any case ever affected you on a personal level, maybe hit you with the emotions that you're like, I shouldn't be feeling this, but I am. Yep. Um, the one case that really, really hit me was the Carissa Boudreaux case. And that happened in my hometown, Bridgewater, Nova Scotia. Um, her mother, Penny Boudreaux, um, was told by her boyfriend that uh, it's either me or your daughter kind of thing. So rather than send the daughter off to live with her dad just down the road in Lockport, uh, Ms. Boudreaux took her 12-year-old out and strangled her with a shoelace, then left her body near the shore uh, of the Lahave River, uh, not wearing any pants, um, to make it look as though she had been raped and left there. So um, eventually through a Mr. Big sort of operation, the police got Penny Boudreau to confess that yes, she had in fact uh, murdered her daughter. And he, she even took them through the, uh, the chain of events uh, and even did sort of a, like a role play to replay what had happened. But the reason that it hit me so hard is my parents' house was right between uh, the apartment building, the apartment building, and the uh, the shore where her body was found. Found it was like literally in the neighborhood that I grew up in. Everything that was mentioned on the news was something that I had personally uh, a place where I was very, very intimately aware, and it was. It was hard to watch, especially knowing the people back there. And, and this stuff doesn't happen in that small town. But in this case, it did. And it just, it ripped people apart. You know, the fact that a mother could murder their, her daughter and then go on TV and beg for someone to bring her home when she knew exactly what she had done and where, where her daughter was. Over the last... 15 years especially around the lower mainland in in canada in british columbia there has been a real rash of of crime that has happened that's led to murderous sprees of gangsters building up in the area that really have been brazen with their crimes uh, you know whether it's the the um these crime families from gangs called the united nations or or others that have really got into it. It really started in 2007, still kind of continues today. Have you ever covered that? No, and there's a reason that I don't cover it is because I live in Surrey where most of that <laughs> happens. And uh, I actually, there's a very high probability of me running into people who were involved with that case. Um, I like the fact that my head is attached to my shoulders uh, I would not like to talk about <laughs> uh, any kind of uh, organized crime. So I, I tended to avoid 
that conversation. And it's not because I think, oh, they'll come get me. It's because I really, I just don't even want to engage with those individuals. I mean, I live around the corner from a club that where uh, there are uh, motorcycle enthusiasts there all the time. So, you know, it's just one of those things where I think it's better that I just kind of avoid the Surrey six and not get into that big conversation. Yeah. You know, you know, what's very interesting about that. I'll take the heat for you. Okay. <laughs> what's very interesting is right at the beginning, uh, my daytime job, I deal with finance mm -hmm. and that's as far as I go into describing what I do. And I was dealing with a realtor in Chilliwack, British Columbia. And this gentleman had, uh, had worked with me on something and I helped him out hmm. and he comes back and he's like, Hey man, have you ever thought of getting into mortgage brokering? You know, I move a lot of houses and you know, I'm doing very well for myself and my mortgage broker is making about half a million dollars a year. Would you be interested in doing that? So I'm like, yeah, I, I would think about that. Not a problem. So I called up a friend of mine who worked in realty in that city and she immediately says, as soon as I bring up his name, says, I'll be at your office in 10 minutes and hangs up on me. So I'm like, well, this can't be very good. Mm. You know, so she shows up at my office. She says, whatever you do, stay the hell away from him. He's mm. into some nasty, nasty stuff. Yeah. And I wouldn't want you to get involved with that. Yeah. Three months later, his mortgage broker and him and a couple others are going to view a house in the promontory area. And he takes six bullets in the chest. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. And, and all I'm thinking was that could have been me. Mm -hmm. And that's what started the entire murderous gang war between the red scorpions, the United nations and other affiliates, including, you know, a lot of the uh, uh, Southeast Asian gangs that are in Vancouver and in the surrounding areas. And that's what kicked it off. And I, I was like, that's a little clo too close for comfort. I see some screaming here in the, in the chat about bikers. And I'm not saying that um, all bikers are, are bad. Don't get me wrong. Like I know some, I have some wonderful friends who are bikers. There are a particular brand of biker who I would rather not piss off. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Very true. We only got about six minutes here left with you tonight, you know, and it's been a, a an eventful evening of awesomeness with you, Mike. Thanks, it really, Dave. It, it really has. And, you know, as we close out, do you have a, do you have a case that you would like to share with our audience before we let you go? Ah, uh, gosh. Um, I don't know. I, I'm really looking forward to covering some f f cases in the future. Um, I am planning a multi-part uh, episode uh, on Paul Bernardo. And I know that is one that people really are interested in hearing me talk about. And I have been working on that for quite some time. So uh, it's looking like it's going to be uh, three, maybe even four episodes of my show. And typically um, I do just a drive by every week with a uh, one parter and I've done some two part shows, but this one is such a big case and is such a prominent case in Canadian history. I think the coverage of it needs to be uh, in depth and, and uh, done in the right way. So again, I want to do things in the right way and I'm going to cover Paul Bernardo. That's a big case. You also have another podcast that you have going on. That's right. Uh, so Morgan Canood uh, and I, Morgan's a paranormal researcher and uh, author. She and I got together for a number of episodes for Dark Poutine. And every time we would chat, we sort of bantered back and forth for a great deal of time and realized, why don't we do something together? So we've got a new show that just dropped on Monday, October 25th, and it is called Supernatural Circumstances. You can find it on Spotify, iTunes, wherever you get your podcasts. And we're going to cover everything from 
a paranormal to supernatural to uh, cryptids, all that kind of stuff. Just things that are right up the alley of the folks who listen to this show. Morgan is a big believer in all of these things. And as you've mentioned, I'm about three out of 10 woo. So I'm the foil. I get to ask her uh, a lot of the hard questions and she has great answers for them. So I'm looking forward to uh, really doing a lot more with her and it's going to be bi-weekly. So uh, every two weeks you can get an episode of dark poutine and an episode of supernatural circumstances. And yet you're not a paranormal guy. I am. I don't say I'm not. I don't say I'm not because if I said I'm not, I would be lying. I'm super fascinated. I am as though, uh, as, uh, as the sign said, as the poster said in Mulder's office, I want to believe. So I really do. I really am open to it. So send me stuff. Show me things. I really want to, within reason, I don't want to see sort of things that are sideways. But things related to the paranormal and the supernatural. Feel free to email me at darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. And I would love to hear from you. That's wonderful. And, you know, we also got to get you up here yeah. for some investigations. We'll go look for Sasquatch. We'll go look for some ghosts. Who knows? I, I just Maybe got a can... new uh, GoPro Max, which is a really cool camera. It does like a 360-degree view. So we can capture all kinds of cool video and, and audio for folks. It's got six microphones. This thing is a real piece of work for 500 bucks. So, Boy, you uh, must be able to zoom in on that mustache pretty tight then. Well, you know, the, the mustache, I call it the flavor saver. I've had soup uh, recently, and mm, mm, there it was, minestrone, yum, yum. You're a close. You're you're about a number three Lanny McDonald right now. Oh yeah. Well, I don't know about that. That's you're okay. looking. You're looking very hair suit yourself, young man, with your oh, my your goodness. your beardiness. Yes, as one person in our chat room said, I'm the Canadian version of Bruce Valanche right now. <laughs> oh, there you go. I'm not doing it very properly, anyways, but. That's exactly it. We got about uh, one minute to go here. You know, I, I really do look forward to you uh, coming on up here and, you know, taking you to some sites of where things have happened. But you got to do it before the end of November because that's okay. usually when the, when the sticky snow starts sticking. Yeah, we don't want any of that. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. We definitely do not want anything to do with that. Uh, God, winter's coming. Uh, oh. Help. Yes. Mike Brown, thank you so much for coming on Thanks Space Out Radio, buddy. It is always a pleasure. And I'm going to give you a phone call tomorrow. Okay. And, and we'll chat about some things uh, going on there. I, I love it when you are on this show. You bring a, a lot of really cool things and, and happenings to us. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate it, my friend. Groovy. Thanks, SOR fans. He's a man of few words. Mike Brown, but with a mustache like that, you don't need a lot of words in order to make things happen. And I know words. I know the biggest words. <laughs> it's going to be absolutely great, you know, and I highly recommend go check out his podcast. Go get his new book coming on out. You're going to love that on November 2nd. And Mike's a good guy. He really is. And he's one that we like to, to support around here. So make sure you check him on out. Coming up next on Spaced Out Radio, I'm mad at NASA. I'll tell you why on the Dave 101 next. And I have an announcement. There will be a Dave sighting in the United States in July. We'll be back with Spaced Out Radio right after this. Great job, Mikey. Thank you. I got to tap out. I have to go wee-wee. Yeah, you go, buddy. <laughs> okay. Go. Have, have a, a good, good night, Dave. Have a good piss, buddy. See you, everybody. <laughs> I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. Mike Brown, everybody. Mike Brown. Uh, who showed up here? I saw a couple people show up. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, there is the stunning and talented Purpose and Grace, who's returned. 
Uh, let's see. A, A Ron, the original. Nice to have you here. Uh, Slobo the Clown. He's got teeth like Bart L. CG, how you doing? Well, let's see. Who else is coming in late? Mm, Behoff. You've been here a while. Uh, John's not wearing his fedora. Believe it or not, I've actually seen John without his fedora. He's got impressive hair. Mm-hmm. It's true. Justin S., nice to have you back. Skip to Malou. What's happening? About to find a wedding outfit. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, Mike's a good guy. Thank you so much, Simon. Appreciate you. Super Duke, what's happening, buddy? Super, super Duke, where are you? We got some Bigfoot to find now. The lovely and talented Teresa. How are you? We're going to buy Bart L. a Chad Smith t-shirt. Send it to him. I noticed Prairie Fire didn't come back after his aha, gotcha moment. Thank you, lovely Carrie Ann. Terrible times. How are you? It's a nice picture of your nostril there. Or is that a cat eye? Is that a nostril or a cat eye? I think it's a cat eye. Look at my TV here. Yeah, it's a cat eye. Arthur L., after like seven months away, I cannot believe that you are here for a full show. I cannot believe that. Harassing my beautiful audience. Bad, Barther. Bad. Uh, Jeremy, I sent a, uh, a uh, Twitter message to Marion Rudnick. Hopefully we could get him on. Yeah, I love me some Thomas Fessler, man. He's a good dude. Very good dude. Hey, Barther, call me next week. Uh, Chad Smith, we're gonna send we're gonna send Barther a t shirt of you. Chad Smith walks around his workplace now. I'm Chad Smith. The whole effing show. He's like the Rob Van Dam of his work. Terrible times. Nice to see you. All right, we got 20 seconds.
We rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot, checking out our swag, Shirky Poo's Newswire, and so much more. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. It's time once again for The Rant with Dave 101. This is a message to the head of NASA, all right? This gentleman, Bill Nelson, he's recently been talking over the last month or so about NASA looking in to UAP, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. Now, the mainstream media has been all over this story because NASA is now looking into it after everything we've heard over the last few years in the mainstream regarding this very sensitive topic. Now, Nelson has been an advocate for space programs throughout his congressional career as a Democrat, first as the Florida House representative and then as a senator. He even traveled to space himself aboard the Columbia shuttle back in 1986. This is a man who is very familiar with astronauts, NASA, and the inside. However, Recently, he sat down and stated that Navy pilots have not seen just a few UAPs or Tic Tacs, whatever you want to call them, that there's been over more than 300 sightings of unidentified flying objects since 2004, quoted saying, and they don't know what it is and we don't know what it is. We hope it's not an adversary here on Earth that has the kind of technology, but it's something. And so... This is a mission that we're constantly looking, what, who's out there? Who are we? How did we get here? How did we come as we are? How did we develop? How did we civilize? And are those same conditions out there in the universe that has billions of other suns in billions of other galaxies? It's so large, I can't conceive it. Now, this is a man who believes the fighter pilots and believes that there is life elsewhere. He goes on to say, I'll tell you what makes me think I'd better be a better steward of what we have because we're messing it up and we're messing it up just the way we're treating each other. So I know what my mission is. It's to be a better steward of this planet and to be a better citizen of planet Earth. Sure, he's playing all the right cards, saying all the right things. But, Mr. Nelson, shouldn't you check under your own bed before you start preaching to the public about what these craft are? For years, there has been rumors that astronauts from Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon, to many others who have claimed that they have seen UFOs. This goes back to the Gemini missions, where pilot Jim McDivitt spotted an object that was white and cylindrical shaped during his flight. His partner, Ed White, was asleep at the time when McDivitt saw this craft. Gemini 7 also saw a bogey claimed by astronauts, which ufologists claims is a reference to a UFO. There are other sightings that have gone on. Astronaut Leroy Chow reported seeing lights in formation he described as in a line, almost like an upside-down checkmark. Well, guess what? In 2005, Elon Musk wasn't in space with his internet satellites. No. 2013, astronaut Christopher Cassidy saw a UFO float past the International Space Station near its Progress 52 cargo ship. All right? I mean, there are things going on. Astronauts are seeing it. Yet, Mr. Nelson is naively saying that NASA now has to look into it. 
Look, if we believe a lot of the rumors that have gone on over the years, whether it's alleged whistleblower Donna Hare, who way back a few years ago on this show and many others claimed that NASA was scrubbing photographs of UFOs that were caught by satellites and flight crews. That's a big claim. If that really was happening, shame on NASA. All right? Astronauts, other people claiming that NASA knows what's going on. There's been reports over the years that almost every launch that NASA has provided since the Apollo missions it has been followed by one or more UFOs. You can look it up. It's not just one of those Google things that you can look up because if it's on Google, it's got to be true. No, 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 no. These are real people who have a vested interest in these projects who have been studied this. So Mr. Nelson is out there now jumping on the UFO game. And it is good that NASA is finally talking about this subject because. We all thought NASA stood for never a straight answer. So here we are in this situation. The media is jumping all on board because prior to 2004, the media doesn't know anything about UFOs. Frankly, they haven't known anything about UFOs since the New York Times article of 2017. They don't know what to ask. They don't know where they should point their information to. And because most reporters today are about clickbait, about Twitter, about TikTok and getting the news out quicker, they don't know how to investigate a story. But that's another topic for another night. This is about NASA. My question, if I had an opportunity to interview Bill Nelson, would be this. Have you looked through NASA's files in history and archives to see if there has been any extraterrestrial or UFO contact over the years? Has NASA scrubbed photos from previous missions. Can you confirm what astronauts like Dr. Edgar Mitchell have said about UFOs? Why do why does there always seem to be these these craft that surround every launch which there have been videos caught of this. NASA for years has should have known about this topic. They've been silent on it for many, many years, too many, to be honest. And if they want to get into the UFO game, we need some, we need some answers. We need some hard questions to be asked. Because NASA, whose role it is, is to play the gatekeeper of space outside of the Russian Soyuz program, and now China and India. We need to figure out what is going on. We need some answers. You can't just step into the UFO game and then say, hey, we're, we're now looking into this. NASA, guess what? And Mr. Bill Nelson, no disrespect. I don't care about the Navy pilots if they've seen over 300 or how many pilots you've talked to about this. I care about what NASA has seen what NASA has covered up. And everybody in the UFO community, whether you're on UFO Twitter or you're a researcher like Grant Cameron or Richard Dolan or many others, you need to be asking those questions to NASA. Have you checked your own files? Have you checked your own archives? Bill Nelson, if you want to learn about this subject, tell us if Donna Hare is telling the truth about scrubbing photos that had UFOs on them. What about the rumor of Neil Armstrong going on the private channel, the emergency channel, saying they are here, they are on the hill, and they are watching us? If it's bunk, tell us. If it's not, tell us why we haven't gone back to the moon. Was it about expense or was it something more? Your archive should know and should tell us. So for Bill Nelson to come out and and play the the card, maybe it's just a ruse. In talking to John Hudson from the Unbiased UFO Report, John clearly states 
that this is something that maybe, just maybe, this is Bill Nelson's baby steps to getting the real truth out, but he needs to start somewhere, which makes sense by what John says. It may be the baby steps to something bigger. Now, do I believe John? I think there's very high possibility. Do I have my own opinion on it? Sure I do. And that is, you don't get a position like Bill Nelson's without asking some questions and without getting in the know. He does know. He should know. And for anybody who has paid attention to NASA over the years, we all know something's going on. We've all sit there and played conspiracy theorist when the International Space Station feed just happens to cut out when something odd seems to be flying by. There are questions about the moon. What is going on on the moon? Why haven't we been back? Why all of a sudden is it so hard to get there when back in the day we were using rockets that had less technology than the iPhone in your hand? That's what doesn't make sense. Were we told not to go back to the moon? We don't know. Maybe Bill Nelson knows, and maybe Bill Nelson should open up NASA's little Pandora's box and let us know what is in there. But he won't. He's going to play dumb, exactly like the United States government. It's going to look good for NASA that they are now investigating these UAPs because the Navy fighter pilots say they are seeing them. But will he tell us what NASA knows? Will he confirm what astronauts know? If I'm an astronaut who has seen a UFO, I'm upset right now because I haven't talked to Bill Nelson. And they know there's a cover-up. Their NDAs, which are probably lifetime, make sure that they are going to stay silent for the entire time. There's a lot of pension involved especially when you're making the salary of an astronaut. We need to push this barrier. We can't just have these little foxholes pop up that we trip into every now and again and look down and see that there's a big deep hole there, but we keep on walking by because that's exactly what we are doing. The media is doing it. The UFO field is doing it, and it's not attractive. It really is not attractive to anything that we are trying to prove or disprove. So far since 2017, the entire U.S. government has played us for fools. Sure, you can trust Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon. They are trying their best to get the information out while withholding information from us due to their non-disclosure agreements. We could say the exact same thing of Bill Nelson, the head of NASA. But Mr. Nelson, I know you won't listen to this. Probably you won't. It's a good chance you won't. But if by chance you do, what are you hiding? What's the real story? Why don't you give us what we really want, which is the questions about NASA's involvement and sightings of UFOs? That's where we need to be. But as long as there's a government cover, calling the shots on the whole NASA project, because they are an entity of the U.S. government and military, we're not going to know. We're going to be left with a million questions and lucky if we get one answer. Because there is a narrative being played. NASA has just joined that narrative. They have left the United States Air Force in silence because the Air Force doesn't want to talk about this. The Navy does, but they only want to talk about a little bit, because nothing ever happened previous in life prior to 2004. We know that. For people who are not believing in a narrative, the NASA narrative of, wow, we got to look into this, is the biggest farce in ufology right now. It really is. We could say, great, On a positive note, on that Buddhist note, we could say, great, Bill Nelson is talking about it.
but what else is he hiding that we do not know? That is the scary part. That is what we need to figure out. Because right now, what he's saying, as impressive as it is, it's not good enough. And the entire government knows, since news channels have become more infotainment than they have news, they know that there are not going to be any hard questions whatsoever asked. And this is a time when someone like Bill Nelson speaks that tough questions need to be asked. Answer the questions, Bill. Be the man. You can be a real leader in this subject. All you got to do is tell us what NASA knows. But of course, you won't. That's your Dave 101 for this week. Thank you so much for checking us on out and leave a comment below. Let me know what you think. Let's get to the news. The truth is always changing, and the news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire, provided by our famous Shirky Poo. And we're going to start off with this real scary one. Baby monitors are a great way to tell if a child is asleep or not, or if a little one needs a parent. But along with small children, the baby cams can also capture some pretty interesting and unexpected things. That's what happened to Heather Brow in Michigan. After waking her one-year-old daughter, Lily, from a nap, Heather noticed three deep purple scratches that mysteriously appeared on the little girl's cheek. Heather assumed Lily accidentally scratched herself with her fingernails, but it didn't match up to the injury. To get to the bottom of it, Brow turned on to her baby monitor. While viewing the footage, she was aghast at what she saw. There seemed to be a ghostly male figure walking past Lily's pack and play, and then disappearing. As if the video wasn't creepy enough, it's not the first instance of paranormal activity in her home. For the past few months, Heather and her fiancé, Josh, have heard screaming, stomping, laughing, and were even once woken up by a man shouting. Heather says that the more scary incidents are, are happening as well. I woke up to get ready for work one morning, and it felt like someone was choking me. It shook me to the point where I decided to buy our camera. This is all happening in Heather, Josh, and Lily's home currently, which happens to be Josh's mom's guest house. And Heather is convinced that they are being haunted by a previous tenant. Apparently, the former owner of Josh's mom's home was an elderly woman who fell down the stairs and broke her hip. Since she lived alone, for hours she laid at the bottom of the stairs, unable to get help, and eventually she died there. Meanwhile, her schizophrenic brother lived in the guest house, Heather said, this is a spirit. I don't know what its intentions are, but at this point, it's becoming physically harmful. This has made us want to leave as soon as possible. As soon as possible, we're out of here. Moving on. The Southwest is a hotbed of UFO activity. It's where Roswell is said to have had the infamous sightings and crashes, where the government is rumored to store extraterrestrials and craft at Area 51 in Nevada, There have been plenty of sightings in Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, and this week one was caught on camera, but not just any camera, a camera that belonged to NBC Nightly News. Cynthia McFadden, reporter, was taking a close look at a water crisis in the Arizona's Navajo Nation, which is currently facing the pandemic, and as the cameras were rolling on native lands playing instruments and singing, an unidentified disc-shaped object can be seen high above them, bursting through the clouds and flying across the sky. While it could be a plane, the way it rips through a cloud makes it seem unbelievable. Yeah, you can check it out on our newswire. If you doubt that it could be some otherworldly craft, remember that last month the government essentially announced UFOs exist. Wow, this guy's behind on the story, isn't he? In fact, a former member of the task force, Lou Elizondo, said they found off-world vehicles not made of this earth. Ah, yes, the crash retrievals. We'll see where we're going with that. Here's one for our friend Barther. In a Netherlands garden, blooms are a rare plant with a tall phallic shape. It is known as the penis plant, 
And this is only the third time the species has flowered in Europe since 1997, according to the University of Leiden's Botanical Garden. Yep, the six-year-old penis plant, the scientific name for it is Amorphophallus deca silvae, was cultivated by gardener Rudmer Postma. Garden personnel first noticed the flower bud in mid-September, and in just over a month, the bud has become about a half meter, over three feet tall, with a narrow stem reaching up to two meters or six feet in height. Few botanical gardens have Amorphophallus decus silvi in their collection, making the flowering of the plant particularly rare. Yes, there is a penis plant out there. Who knew? Who knew? And finally tonight, apparently sharks do not hunt humans. No, no. One in 3.7 million chance a person is going to be killed by a shark in their lifetime. According to Shirky Poo, a team of biologists as well from the UK and Australia compared footage and they see believe that the sharks are likely colorblind and they can't tell the difference between a seal and somebody the size of me swimming in the water. You know what? Just better not to take the chance. Don't go in the ocean. Otherwise, you are literally going to get eaten by sharks. That is that their territory, not ours, and best to stay out. Thank you to everybody for listening tonight. Thank you to Shirky Poo for the news, for all of you tuning into the Dave 101, and of course, Mike Brown from the Dark Putin podcast, hanging on out, talking some true crime with us tonight. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat room tonight. Even you, Barther, on YouTube, LGAB, Revolution Radio, Twitch, Facebook, the Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Somewhere. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us because together, my friends, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night, but soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. So I forgot to tell you guys during that, I got so excited about my, my Dave 101 rant. I forgot to tell you guys that I found out today and I have been asked and I have accepted to be a speaker at MUFON's UFO conference in 2022. It'll be held in Denver, Colorado. And... Let me get the email here. Um, no, that's not the one. Here it is. It's July 8th to 10th, the 2022 MUFON Symposium in Denver, Colorado at the downtown Sheridan. UFOs in the spotlight, how the media reacts to UFOs now and then. So that's what I will be speaking on is media and UFOs. And I don't know who else is going to be there. I just know that I have accepted. 
and I'll be sending them the information here very, very quickly on getting everything going. And so in July, hopefully right after the Vegas party, we'll be able to hang on out in Denver. And I would love to see as many Spaced Out Radio listeners there wearing our swag and hanging on out with us. Yes. I'm very excited, very happy about this. I'm ecstatic, to be honest. I don't get to use the word ecstatic enough. So I'm pretty happy about it. And I'd love to meet up with some of you guys in Denver, Colorado. All I know is it's somewhere in the western side of the central U.S. Somewhere right there. It's right there. U.S. here. Apparently they got good air. I've never been there. I'm looking forward to it. So if you guys want to come play along, would love to see you. Yeah, I would. That'd be fun. July 8th to 10th. So who's coming to Denver with me? I don't know if they want me to tell those stories, Bart, because I haven't been probed. I'm like you. I'm not eating breakfast for dinner in uh, in Denver. That would be after Vegas. If everything goes as planned, that would be after Vegas. And yes, Bartha L., you are invited to the Vegas party. Joe, you're going to have to find your way. Teresa's going to come. Teresa always comes to see me speak. It's pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. Love her for it. Arthur, I'll be back in uh, San Francisco in February if that concert flies. Concert, conference, pardon me. Uh, border opens uh, November 9th. So, officially allowed to travel. I'm kind of excited about that. I haven't gone anywhere for a while. And I want to get the hell out of here for a bit.
Because the snow is coming. I'm not ready for winter. Sonny, you get the lip blade modeling that mustache. He'll be just fine. That's the truth. Hello, gorgeous Jennifer Hawkins. How are you? I hate you, Bart. I hate you sometimes. God, you make me laugh. All right. Any questions? Put them in can in capital letters if you don't mind. Oh, if Chad Smith went to a UFO conference, he'd be doing nothing but signing autographs the entire time. People would be coming running up to them with their snap-on wrenches asking for autographs. Snap-on should really sponsor Chad Smith. Uh, apparently she's still, and Jelly is still picking her team of who's going to be going to the mountains to see the aliens. It's all I know. You got that right. SOR royalty, Chad Smith, right there. No, Bartha, I haven't heard that. Wait a second. Is there a Chad Smith YouTube channel now? Now I got to go look. God, everything is Chad Smith from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. I hate how hard it is to find a profile on... YouTube. Hate that. Profile. Oh, 
Well, there's Chad Smith, the fisherman, holding a couple bass. Now I got to go through all of our subscribers here and find Chad Smith. Chad, just grab the link and put it in the chat room. It'd be faster. Oh, there it is. Hold on. Let me go there. I got to go into the other one here. Hold on. Thank you, Big Willie. Oh, he's up to 18. There's nine. Here, let's let's take a listen to this. Hold on. We're going to restart this. I'm pretty sure it starts off as I'm Chad Smith and you're not. Hold on. Let's hit pause on that. Why? All right. So let me just unmute this. Smith Podcasting Channel. I have no idea what I'm going to use this channel for. Oh, oh, but... here we go. Hold on. Here we go. Hey guys, welcome to the Chad Smith Podcasting Channel. I have no idea what I'm going to use this channel for, but I just figured I should probably grab the name before somebody else grabs it. <clears throat> Red Hot Chili Peppers. <clears throat> no, really. This is the real Chad Smith, and you have found my channel. So please stick around, hit that subscribe button, and who knows where this is going to take me. <laughs> you guys have a good day. Peace. That's Chad Smith right there. How about them? Ham and eggs right there. That's breakfast for breakfast. Manly breakfast for breakfast. Do people get... Uh, I don't know. I hope not. People get abducted during MUFON conference? I have no idea. Hope not. Number 19, Chad. Hey, gorgeous Lala, what's happening? Are you late? Kind of. That's okay. The main thing is you are here. Right here. Right now. Right here. Right now. Right here. Right now. Right here. Right now. Justin Pogi era. That hurts. They didn't train him well. Came off that wonderful World Juniors in Vancouver. The kid couldn't. You, I mean, kid was stopping everything. Blank in Russia in the final 5-0. I was at that game. Uh, and more the... And no... It's more the Mike Palmatier era or Michelle Dion era. Almost Ken Reggett era. Definitely not the Yuri Sirha era. I don't know what's worse, the Ken Reggett era or the Andre Rasico era. Come on, Barther. You loved the red light Rasico era. Him and Jocelyn Thibodeau.
They're all goaltenders. Tebow, that's right. Sorry about that. Not Tebow. What about Matthew Garon or Martin Garon? Wasn't he the right-handed goalie? Never happened to Quebec being a goaltender factory. Man, they've gone downhill. Hi, typical watch. Good night, gorgeous Teresa. Oh, give me one sec here. No, but Bart, what I'm saying is, you go back 20 years, Quebec was a goaltending factory. It was awesome. And Flurry's 36 years old. Lala, we are planning a Vegas get together for April, end of April, early May. And what we're going to do, it's not going to be a conference, it's just going to be a gathering. I may be speaking in February in San Francisco. I don't know yet if that conference, if UFO Con is going to go on. I'm hoping it does. Um, and then I'll be in Denver July 8th through 10th uh, for the MUFON conference. I don't know anything after that. Arthur, you got teeth like Austin Powers before he got them fixed. 
I will have a table there, Lala. If you want to make alien balloons at my spaced out radio table, I'm okay with that. I'm very okay with that. Wow. Purpose and grace. Balloon probes. Boom. Right there. Lala, uh, hit me up on Facebook Messenger. I don't know if you're on Facebook, but you can hit me up there. We can talk about it. Maybe Bertha will show up. Good night, typical watch. Thanks for checking on in, buddy. Good night, Char. Oh. I am loving this UFO garage hoodie. Loving it. Hey, Bartha, you should go... You should go click subscribe to the Chad Smith podcast. I'm hoping, Davey. I'm hoping. I know Lorian's trying hard to make it work, so we'll see. I've been in touch with her. <clears throat> It all depends on the COVID protocol down in there. That's that's one of the bigger issues. Hold on. What's my profile thing here? Here. You have to add me to chat to me. Super Lou, what are you doing up, buddy? How's your cape?
Oh, the annual parents visit. Mm. Good luck. Uh, my favorite flavor would be pineapple. I'm on grape ice right now. Do doesn't taste as good. Good night, Advocate for Peace. I think I added you, Lala. Confirm for me that I added you, if you don't mind. Hello, gorgeous Carol. How are you? Skip to Malou? What's happening? Careful, Chad Smith. I'll get him to subscribe to you.
This room is rated CS for Chad Smith. Good night, Jenny. Here, I'll put the link in the chat room again. Round table tomorrow night on the show. I'm still uh, finalizing the panel. I got you, balloon maker. I got you now. Hi, gorgeous D. Swiger. How are you? It's only 1236 here.
downloaded. Cool. It is not, Davey. You are you are on the same time zone I am, you weirdo. Davey, where on Vancouver Island are you? Oh, you're in Campbell River. Their junior B team used to be really good back when I was coaching. <clears throat> Which reminds me, I should go here. That's not what I wanted. All right, so Bob is out. Jennifer's out. Holly's in, John's in. Still waiting on Merle and Nicole. All right. Well, that's about it for tonight. Roundtable tomorrow night, final Friday of the month. Should be a good one. Waiting on hearing from a couple people to see if they're going to join us. And a couple people drop out due to their schedules. So uh, we'll get to that tomorrow night and we'll have a good show for you. Want to say a big thank you to Teresa, Patrick, Willie, Simon times two, Snakes, Mark, Happy, Chad, Apollo, Jason, Cat Chaser and Smithy for the amazing super chats. Big thank you to all of you tuning us in tonight. Really do appreciate it. Don't forget, you can go get our swag by going to our website, spacedoutradio.com forward slash shop, and you can hang on out there and uh, 
choose whatever you want to get. It's all good. We absolutely love the support. When you take a picture of your support, bravo, bravo, she says. When you take a picture, do us a favor and um, send it to us so that way we can put it up on our website. That would be wonderful if you could do that. Thank you to all the veterans who are uh, checking us on out and hanging on out. You always have a safe home here on Spaced Out Radio. Do not forget, if you aren't following us on social media just yet, go to Spaced Out Radio or at Spaced Out Radio on Twitter, at Dave Scott SOR for my personal profile on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show and at Dave Scott SOR. We'll talk to you all tomorrow night. Thank you so much for being with us. We love you and we'll talk to you very, very soon. Have a good one. Thank you.